Golden Globers, episode 29, GPS. Let's get it. In a world. What's up, fam? We already got people spiraling in the chat. I may turn slow mode chat on. Because, you know, Globers are so sure about the globe that they have to come in a flat earther stream and freak out. But anyway, if you want to support the stream, links in the description, ko-fi.com slash it. They'll pop up on the screen, including the message as well, and then the YouTube chat. If you want to join the stream, I'm gonna do a presentation like always, and then we're gonna open the platform up. Um, and we're gonna go through a bunch more specifics of GPS. I'm gonna cover more of like a meta about GPS satellites um, and misconceptions. People seem to think that somehow it proves the Earth is a magic spinning globe, and well, we school Glovers here. So we're going to correct that misconception um and if yeah if you want to join for the open discussion portion of the stream there is a link in the description it's a discord link it'll take you straight to the room and then uh if you disagree you get priority once we cover everything i think tonight um once i get through with my kind of meta analysis we're going to cover a few more things but we will let globe earth proponents speak as always um i encourage people in the chat to just kind of be normal people and and like let's talk about the information instead of spamming the chat with insults but teach their own uh i do again i'll just say I, I tell the mods just to be pretty chill when people act like that it shows everyone else that that's exactly what you don't want to be uh so it's actually they're helping us more than they realize cool i think we're gonna get right into it so let me switch over for the Discord screen. All right. So we're gonna cover GPS. A lot of people ask me to start like putting the, the subjects in uh, the title. So I'll go back and I'll update them the best I can. We'll start doing that. GPS is a really big subject. Um, but again, I'm gonna specifically acknowledge the claim that it only works on a spinning globe and it proves relativity and all this weirdo stuff we're going to prove that that is in fact not correct and it's quite the opposite so let's just get into it all right so let me kind of introduce this actually um the way that so let's just grant the claim of satellites rotating 
over top of the Earth. Let's just grant that's the case. If we look at their routes projected on a flat projection, you just have ellipses. Um, fits right within torus field geometry. It could be catching a vortex just spinning around an ellipsis. That's just a coordinate system transform. So the very paths of the GPS satellites are in no way exclusive to a globe. It's just a coordinate system transform. It would be ellipse. Of course, in their math, they account for a change in direction of an ellipse. That's how we do the math, the equations, the physics. So that's pretty interesting. Now let's get into it. And this is it, like if people deny this stuff, it's really weird because it's just a fact. And we'll pull up the actual uh, path and everything like that. So when they put the satellites up, they use an ECEF as an Earth centered, Earth fixed coordinate system. The still man from that side is, well, we're. Uh, shooting satellites off from the Earth, around the Earth, you know, we're concerned with its relationship with the Earth. Why would we not use an Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinate system? Uh, we may as well. Now, of course, a more accurate system based on that model would be a solar barycentric system. But the math is way more complicated, and so they use ECEF. And if you do the math all the way down, you're gonna get the same answers either way. The math is just much more complicated for the solar, solar barycentric uh, system. Now, what's interesting though, is that the physics are not the same. So, let's get into that. So, of course, if you're using the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinate system, then you're treating it like the Earth's fixed and stationary and that everything's moving around it. That's what fixed means. So then you get into this question here. Can the cosmos be rotating around a stationary Earth? And again, this is how we treat it for the satellites. So before we get into the fact that there's thousands of balloons and you know it's openly uh, acknowledged at this point that can be up there for two months. Uh, some of them are classified. We don't, you know, they go up to 180,000 feet, can be up there for two months. You could have uh, fleets of these. They catch them. Admittedly, we've seen them crashing out of the sky. All of this is true. But also, you could just have satellites. And so we're just not even going to, we're just going to grant the satellites and, and actually demonstrate how that refutes heliocentrism if they are actually up there. Now, do I expect people to accept it? No. But do I expect truth seekers to actually look into it? Yes. So this is not for those who are of a closed mind. So the, the question would be, can the cosmos be actually rotating around a stationary Earth if that's what we're using the coordinate system as? This is when you're going to get into someone named Ernst Mach, and that is, of course, where you get Mach being the speed of sound, right? Discover the speed of sound. So this is one of the only reasons people don't just dismiss him as a quack when I bring this up, because I can't. Um, anyway, so Ernst Mach explained that motion around a central body, such as the Earth, will result in a net force acting upon said central body. So long story short, Ernst Mach comes around, and I'll pop over to the intermission screen for a second. Ernst Mach comes around after a couple hundred years of Newtonian mechanics. And of course, at the time, we have Newtonian mechanics, we have the ether, both just assumed, the heliocentric model assumed for the vast majority. And then Ernst Mach comes around, he says, you guys have overlooked something this entire time, right? You think that Newtonian mechanics, it only works within the heliocentric model, but when Newton developed this, these are all just facts. I encourage you to go verify all of this. But if, you're, if your response is to say, Witsit is a flat earther. He can't know what he's talking about. He's cherry picking. He's quote mining. He must be wrong. Ha ha ha. You don't understand anything. You're just lying. Anything like that. I mean, you're coping, bro. I'm just telling you the truth. This is what happened. Ernst Mach comes around and he says, you guys overlook something. When Newton came up with his theory and side note, Newton actually said that the earth could be stationary and geocentric, actually proposed 
alternative ether theories, I mean gravity theories, and he proposed ether theories, in fact said there had to be an ether for his gravity to be true. All that's a side note, he assumed the sun was in the center of the entire universe. Then he takes, the, he takes of course, Kepler's laws, the kinematics, he applies his dynamics, and he assumes, you get into where you're assuming certain distances and certain masses, and proportionate masses between these planets, the Earth, and the sun, and they used Venus to do it predominantly. Okay. Ernst Mach says, well, yeah, you guys think, oh, well, that wouldn't work if you have a bigger mass of the sun, everything's going to move around it, but you didn't realize that he was assuming a sun-centric universe. And, of course, we know that's not the case now, and so if you account for all the other masses out there in the universe spinning around the Earth, then you could have a dynamic equivalence inside of Newtonian mechanics and he used the bucket experiment to explain it. A bunch of people gave him flack, and, and the reason they gave him flack is because he came along and said, you guys overlooked something for 200 years, right? And so that's the way it always is. Someone that's smart enough to think for themselves to find holes or cracks in the current consensus and then comes along and presents it, they're gonna get kicked back and people like instinctively and impulsively start attacking and criticizing the idea. In fact, ironically, even within uh, your guys' paradigm that did that to Einstein when he first proposed his theory. So if if people today are acting like that, it's pretty ironic. That doesn't make any sense. But anyway, so everyone was just kind of writing it off. He was getting criticized at times about it because he came along and said, you guys were, were wrong about something so fundamental this entire time, and he used the simple Newton bucket experiment to explain it. Okay, well... Long story short, Einstein ends up going through his theory and conceding that it had to be true, and in fact, he couldn't even propose his theory of relativity if it wasn't true, and that's of course because it uses the general theory of relativity, not the general relativity theory, right? The actual just theory of relativity, which is of course that one can be, uh, basically motions can be uh, vice versa, as simple as we can say that. And that came long before Einstein. So hopefully you followed all that. The point is, Einstein ended up having to admit it from his Einsteinian uh, system. He's talking about in the Newtonian framework, and Ernst Mach is absolutely true, and we're about to cover exactly why. So that is the real history of what happened. It's important to understand, and basically, again, Mach just explained that motion around a central body, such as the Earth, would result in a net force acting upon said central body, right? And again, he used the bucket. This is a pretty undeniable fact, so. Moving on. So it is seen that the Coriolis acceleration not only cancels the centripetal acceleration, but together they provide a net centripetal radially inward component of acceleration that is directed toward the center of rotation. Now it's funny because when I say that sentence, it's word salad, right? I say you have a set of inertial forces, you're gonna have centrifugal forces, you're also gonna have Coriolis forces, which are gonna give you a, a net radially inward accelerative force. Oh, it's word salad. Well, of course, that's not, that's not true. Coriolis acceleration will overcome centrifugal force twice as strong, thus result in a net centripetal force inward. It's twice the magnitude, so the net would be inward. So you're gonna have the angular momentum of the cosmos spinning around the, the Earth. That's gonna create a net radially inward accelerative force. Very important. Very important. Now, Coriolis is a real thing. The fact that the current globe Earth belief has bastardized the phenomena is a different conversation altogether. It is a real phenomena in physics, of course. Okay, so important components to understand here because when you talk about GPS, this is what they use. They use an Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinate system, fact. They, their math and physics thus have to account for real inertial forces, fact, because they use Newtonian mechanics, fact. Even if you used Einsteinian mechanics, you would have to account for those if you use the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinate system, fact. Okay, these are all just facts. So if you're gonna then put it up there and it works, well, wait, wait, how's it working? If these assumptions of physics aren't true, how would it be working? It gets worse. All right, so we also have my boy Andre Assis here with relational mechanics and he breaks down uh, even the Einsteinian dynamic equivalence. And it's important to understand some of this, I'm gonna try not to get too much into the weeds, but, and let me also find this. Uh, let me do this real fast, let me go full screen. 
I'm gonna make sure I pull up my other my other presentation too, because I want to find a quote. Okay, and I'll pull that up at the end. How dare you? All right. Let's get back to it. Full screen. All right. So he also breaks this down. And uh, he shows all the math, all the physics. Now, I've sent this to many people. Um, they'll all say that I'm making this up. It's cherry-picked. It's wrong. Whatever. Show me the math. Show me the math. Well, then I give them all this math. And then they just, I just get crickets. And they claim they didn't get it. I gave it to the astronomer, PhD astronomer Robert Parks. Said he didn't get it. And then in public, I'm like, you absolutely did get it. I send it to you immediately. Then he, next time I talked to him, he conceded that all the math and physics does in fact work out. He just had some questions about, you know, what would be causing it to move around and stuff like that. I'm like, well, <laughs> it says so in the paper. So long story short, these two numerical calculations show that general relativity does not yield the measured values of these quantities in the Earth's frame of reference. This analysis shows clearly that in general relativity, kinematically equivalent situations are not dynamically equivalent. Now, this is pretty interesting when he actually shows the math, he shows that relativity can't even hold up to the required equivalence. But Newtonian, Newtonian dynamics does. Now, this can be debated because you get into certain interpretive aspects of uh, the mathematic that is relativity. But we don't have to get into all that, but specifically that it doesn't necessarily necessitate a constant speed of light in the presence of strong gravitational fields or a medium that is moving. Okay, here we have defined... Uh, this equation to to let to be the Coriolis term becomes similar to Lorentz magnetic force. So the Coriolis, right? Like so, the radially inward force that's being assumed, the inertial force that's accounted for in the actual GPS satellite equations, right? And he's showing that using Newtonian mechanics, you can just treat it like a Lorentz magnetic force for the mathematical purposes. It might be called the gravitational magnetic field generated by the rotation of the set of distant galaxies. Pretty interesting, huh? Pretty interesting. I would say this is flirting with an accurate model. Not quite, though, because, you know, Newtonian mechanics drops the ball, but the point is that you're getting in the right direction if you acknowledge that, well, it's a torus field. Everything within it is going to be contributing to the magnetic field, the spatial extension that is the magnetic field, but we won't get too far into the weeds. It's about GPS. Um, here he points out the flattened vigor of the Earth, assumed as a, as a uh, globularist, of course, or Foucault's pendulum can no longer be utilized as proofs of the Earth's real rotation. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. This is not just a random guy. This is a physics professor. He shows you all the math and the physics and explains, you can't claim that if a pendulum moves around that it's proof of the earth spinning because we've just shown very clearly that if you account for everything in the universe you would have a dynamic equivalence here we also have dr luca papu of newtonian machian analysis of the neo-tyconian model for planetary motions published by the european journal of physics in 2013 in his conclusion he explains there's another interesting remark that follows from this analysis if one could put the whole universe in accelerated motion around the earth the pseudo potential corresponding to pseudo force will immediately be generated that same pseudo potential then causes the universe to stay in that very state of motion without any need for exterior forces acting upon it now what's funny is all of a sudden all of a sudden globe earthers get how pseudo is kind of sus Wait, it says pseudo-force. Wait, isn't that funny? Keep that same energy in a few seconds. <laughs> so this is a Neo-Tyconian uh, model. I don't even care about that at all. It is interesting to show that he shows the dynamic equivalence. He actually tried to pu publish a follow-up paper. He kind of softballed this one, and he published a follow-up that just dunks on heliocentrism. And that's when they put together he was actually a geocentrist as opposed to just showing the dynamic equivalence, and they refused to publish it. That's real science. But all the math and physics couldn't be rebutted. So anyway, Steven Weinberg here, he says, if we were to adopt a frame of reference like Tycho's in which the Earth is at rest, then the distant galaxies would seem to be executing circular turns once a year. And in general relativity, this enormous motion would create forces akin to gravitation, which would act on the sun and planets and give them the motions of the Tychonic theory. 
which is geocentric, of course. Newton seems to have had a hint of this in an unpublished Proposition 43 that did not make it into the Principia. Newton acknowledged that Tycho's theory could be true if some other force besides ordinary gravitation acted on the sun and planets. Now, of course, disclaimer. I am not invoking the masses of the sun or planets or distances or the masses or distances of galaxies. Not the point. The point is that there is a dynamic equivalence indisputably. The kinematic equivalence is still disputed by some people in this circle, but that's laughably irrelevant in the real world. You'll never find someone with any degrees in any of these subjects that would ever dispute the kinematic equivalence. And you should understand that simply by reading the title of Einstein's theory. It's that goofy. So we're talking about dynamic equivalence. This is next level and even Newton knew that back then. Okay, all this is important because what do they use when they put these satellites up? They use an Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinate system. They use Newtonian mechanics, and they account for real inertial forces. And even if you used Einsteinian, which they do not, then you still are having real inertial forces because of the kinematic and dynamic equivalents. So, here we have the uh, proposition that was unpublished, conveniently enough, the last thing he wrote. So the context is he wrote the whole Principia and then the thing that he thought was important to add at the very end of everything he wrote was, well, with all that being said, in order for the Earth to be at rest in the center of the system of the sun, planets and comets, there's required both universal gravity and another force in addition that acts on all bodies equally according to the quantity of matter in each of them and is equal and opposite to the accelerative gravity with which the Earth tends to the sun. And thus celestial bodies can move around the Earth at rest as in the Tychonic system. And this is not even accounting for additional masses outside of the local solar system as he assumed the sun was in the center of the universe. So if you're following, even if you were to go all the way back to the time of Newton, he says, if there's an equal and opposite reaction going on, which is how physics works, by the way, it's called pressure mediation and all things abide by that. There are no exceptions and there never will be, except in this model, people think that gravity is an exception. Um, the point is that he's saying, uh, with well, the equal and opposite reaction, the Earth could be in the center. Now, when you take away the assumption that the, Earth, that the sun's in the center of the whole universe, it's an immediate dynamic equivalence, even without the equal and opposite reaction. So hopefully you guys are following because um, I'm making a meta about the actual dynamic implications of the GPS satellites. And then uh, we're going to open it up. We're going to get into more of the specifics about the GPS signals themselves. All right. So here we go. Uh, now these are all well-revered people that are notorious for having the most thorough ex uh, understanding of relativity. And that should always have an asterisk beside it because uh, relativity is intrinsically not understandable. It is paradoxical, but anyway. Uh, we don't necessarily have to read this whole part, but again, he points out here, for example, if we consider a purely mechanical system consisting of a number of material particles acted upon by given forces and with the velocity small compared with the velocity of light relative to a system of inertia, Newton's fundamental equations of mechanics may be applied with good approximation in the description of this system. On the other hand, if we wish to describe the system in an accelerated system of reference, we must introduce, as is well known, so-called fictitious forces, centrifugal forces, Coriolis forces, etc which have no connection whatever with the physical properties in the mechanical system itself. In fact, they depend exclusively on the acceleration of the system of reference introduced relative to the systems of inertia. Now, it's important to note that within this heliocentric paradigm, you have to count, you have to call these pseudo forces, and, there are, and that meaning that there's no truly known source and they're strictly like illusory, they're effectively illusory relative to reference frame. Okay. We may can go back over this later. I don't want to read all of it. Here's the important part here. This should, it should break it down for everyone. So here's the depiction of the Newtonian system. And so you have the Earth is going to continue in a straight path, right? Because of inertia. So the Earth's mass seeks to move in a straight line at, at the velocity of the momentum so that P equals MV. Right, So momentum equals mass times velocity. So the Earth is going to continue in a straight path. 
unless what? What does Newtonian mechanics say? The object will continue in a straight path unless an outside force acts upon it. So now let's get some outside forces. What do we have? We have centrifugal and we have centripetal forces. So you have centripetal forces by gravity and as the gravity causes it to go around the sun, you then get the centrifugal effect. Centripetal plus inertia equals angular momentum of Earth around the sun. Okay, now this is assuming heliocentrism within Newtonian mechanics. Now, this is also what they're using for their satellites. It's very important to understand this. If you put satellites in the sky and you're using real inertial forces in your physics and equations, you're using Newtonian mechanics. Yeah, cool, you can do the math different ways. You can use an ECF. Oh, let's magically transform it to an ECI, which could never work, it's just a mathematical transform. Let's just completely ignore that it's not the solar barrier centric coordinate system that we claim to be true, because sure, that one's just more complicated. Sure, we're from the Earth, it's all in relation to the Earth, and we can get all the math to come down to the same numbers. That is not what this is about, though. Getting this final mathematical solution to be synonymous does not mean anything. And I'm going to go on full camera here because this seems to be a concept that I cannot get people to land, land with. All right. If I have three theories and I can work all the theories out and get the same mathematical solution, but the three theories make completely opposite claims, would all three of the solutions being the same mean that all three theories are true? If I get the same solution in three theories mathematically, could all three theories be actually true in reality if they make contradictory claims of physics? Of course not. The fact that you can use many methods to get to the same mathematical solution means nothing. We're talking about physical reality, physics, mechanics, dynamics, reality. It's important to understand the distinction. Word salad. <laughs> Someone just said this was word salad. All right, so very important. And, and dude, I'm gonna say, if you're, if you're coping to the extent that like, you can't accept what I just said, that's kind of weird. Um, so anyway, the point is that this is what they're using for the GPS satellites, right? So again, they have ellipses, that's a change in path, right? It's like a curved path. Uh, it's an ellipse over a plane, no big deal. Coordinate system transform means nothing. Let's talk about the physics, the equations, right? The mechanics of the satellites. If this satellite's going, let's, we're using the Earth. The, let's say the Earth's a satellite, the sun is the Earth, right? If you put this satellite supposedly in space or wherever, and it's about to go around the Earth, like the Earth's going around the sun, what do you need if you're using Newtonian mechanics? You need uh, forces to prevent it from continuing on its straight path due to inertia. Okay. So it's very important to understand that this, this graphic right here should pull it all together for you guys you get centripetal and centrifugal forces. And again, what happens? What happens if you flip it over with a dynamic equivalence of the Earth being stationary, which what do the satellites use? An ECEF, what does that stand for? Earth-centered, Earth-fixed, which means stationary. If we treat the Earth as stationary, which we are, right? then you're going to get angular momentum of the cosmos moving around the Earth. And this is gonna result in centrifugal forces. So, so that everyone knows what that is, right? It's like if you put a ball on the end of a string and started spinning around, it's the tendency for that ball to go out away from the center of rotation because of its momentum. And you're also gonna get a Coriolis force. It's the momentum actually pulling it in. Both of these things exist now people do all kinds of mental gymnastics to try to act like uh so one does one doesn't blah 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 but the reality is that they do both exist right Coriolis is a real uh, effect in physics can be easily demonstrated centrifugal force also is as well what happens if you have the angular momentum moving around an earth-centered earth-fixed coordinate system right is you would have twice the magnitude of the Coriolis 
and that would be a real force as opposed to in the heliocentric model where it's just a pseudo force, a fictitious force. It would be a real actual force in relation to absolute space, right? And even if space has motion within it, it's a background that can be uh, measured against. And of course, the, the thing that we truly use is the lab frame. So if you have a stationary lab frame, that's gonna be your absolute frame to measure against, and then you could have a drift within the background. All right, I don't wanna to get too in the weeds here. So the, the point is that you're gonna have the Coriolis be twice the magnitude of the centrifugal force. So what does that mean? That means that you're gonna have a net centripetal force. And uh, this is why it's funny because people say, it's word salad when I say centrifugal divergence or centripetal convergence. Well, those are, those are just different descriptions of the same phenomena. Centripetal, it's going to be basically converging in, going in towards the center. Centrifugal diverges out from the center, right? So you're gonna have twice the magnitude of the centripetal force. So that is a radially inward accelerative force. It's a real force and therefore it can keep you perpetually moving around the center of rotational axis. Now we'll cover this as many times as we need to. I knew I'd get word salad allegations. It's just because it's, it's just, a, I had to step up a little, we had to go up a little level here for the stream, but this is for the people that want to know the truth. So again, when we look at this, Einstein, uh, Newton knew it himself, right? Newton himself acknowledged this. It's important to understand, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude in a sec. Now, here's another ironic part of all of this is uh, even with, this is uh, WGV Rosser, an introduction to the theory of relativity, again, well known to be uh, considered one of like the utmost experts in terms of relativity. And here he is explaining that there's actually a misnomer and, and the only reason this is in here from the presentation back in the day was to show actually you even have to concede a dynamic equivalence with relativity in every way, including the speed of light. Because it actually says, if gravitational fields are present, the velocities of either material bodies or the light can assume any numerical value depending on the strength of the gravitational field. If one considers the rotating roundabout as being at rest, the centrifugal gravitational field assumes enormous values at large distances, and it is consistent with the theory of general relativity for the velocities of distant bodies to exceed the speed of light in a vacuum under these conditions. Pretty interesting most people and now he explains all of it in the paragraph right above that but we don't have time for that the point there is that even with if even if you assumed the like mind destroying convoluted nonsense that is relativity actually with distant galaxies and all these masses a bunch of pseudoscientific assumptions as well you would have to concede that everything could move around the earth in the center so now uh this is the this is the part I really want to drive home here just to, to, to wrap everything back up. They say satellites are going around the Earth. They use Newtonian mechanics and they use an Earth-centered Earth fixed coordinate system. So what they do in their physics and equations are they, they account for, and I know this is like the fifth time I've said it, they account for real inertial forces, Euler forces, which is one of the, the not as dominant forces here, right? And then they account for centrifugal forces, and a Coriolis force. The Coriolis force is, wait for it, twice the magnitude. So it seems the Coriolis acceleration not only cancels the centrifugal acceleration, but together they provide a net centripetal radially inward component of acceleration that is directed toward the center of rotation. Okay, so this is gonna effectively give you if you have a stationary earth with the cosmos moving around it, right? You would just get angular momentum that was basically pushing you in towards the center of rotation and would just keep you going perpetually. That's what it would do. The satellites actually use the equations and physics of that system. So basically what's going on is they throw us, if this is real and we grant the satellites, they're putting a satellite up as if the earth is stationary and the universe is spinning around it, creating a force, generating forces. And the net force actually would keep it moving perpetually around the earth. 
And they account for, and we'll get more into this when I open it up. They account for a change in velocity. They account for a curved path. You have a problem. Einstein says that you're fault. You're you know you're not in a curved path. You don't have a change in velocity. And so there are many other problems, but I wanted to focus on the meta of the actual orbital mechanics itself. It's very ironic. And then I'll close it off with this quote. I'll have to find him. But this guy sums it up pretty nicely. And then we'll wrap it up. But uh, I think that this is going to be an information dense stream, to be honest. It's crazy because we, sh- we got started a little late, but here we go. Found him. It's all good. It is what it is. Let me read this final quote here. Oh, the, the word salad. This is quote mining. All right. Paste. All right. Hopefully you guys can see that, I think. So he says... Yeah, you guys can see it. Again, once more for the record, it has been shown at least six different ways this century alone that the equations and physics used by NASA to launch satellites are identical to the equations derived from a geocentric universe. Thus, if the space program is proof of anything, and that's a big if, it's proof of them, it's proof of fakery and deception, Thus, if the space program is proof of anything, it proves geocentricity and disproves heliocentrism. The evidence for heliocentrism is even weaker than the evidence for evolution. Astronomer, PhD astronomer Gerardus Bow. What is so interesting is that what he's saying is again, the physics and equations used to launch satellites assume a geocentric universe where the earth is stationary and fixed in the center of that universe hence geocentric and the universe moves around the earth generating forces that keep the satellites moving around the earth so if you assumed all that put it up there successfully well that would be positive physical evidence for that actual assumption that you utilize for practical use. So we're gonna get more into how like that, that assumption doesn't even work within heliocentrism, which means if those satellites are up there, it is proof that the earth is not moving. We're gonna get much more into it as we get into um, all of the parts of GPS that show that relativity cannot be true. And of course, without relativity, we've covered a million different ways. If you don't have relativity, you don't have heliocentrism. So. We'll get into those specifics. I'm going to open it up, and I know I got, uh, I know I got my boy Shane, Toby, Allen here, and uh, we're going to get more into it. If you have any genuine uh, questions, pl- at me. Um, if you're just trolling, I'm going to ignore you. Um, so yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy that. It wasn't too confusing. It's pretty simple, right? I said it a few different ways, but if the if the GPS satellites are proof of anything, I mean. They're, they're assuming the Earth's not moving, that the universe is moving around it, and that they're actually accounting for those forces that a spinning universe would generate. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Now, I would tell you, well, we've actually measured the drift within the background medium, and so it generating actual angular momentum would be inevitable. Of course, it has to happen. If you have something spinning in a vortex or spinning around, it's going to generate angular momentum. It has to do that, Right. And so it makes perfect sense to me, actually, that you could throw something up and you have no physical uh, impedance of air or much less air, right? And you throw something up, well, you're going to get angular momentum of the cosmos moving around you. The closer you get to the sky, the more you're going to feel the impact of that force. So, cool. Um, I'm going to... Yeah, so we'll go ahead and open it up. And then just a quick reminder, um, if you want to support the stream, uh, links in the description will also be up on the screen. It's ko-fi.com slash what's it. Your, your, uh, your question or donation will pop up on the screen. 456 watching, 170 likes. Yeah, actually, I'm just going to stare in the camera awkwardly until you like the, you smash the like button. I can sit there all day. Okay, no. <laughs> do it or don't. 
words out is literally the only defense they have so freaking sad i know it's it's actually uh we were talking about it you should just take that as a complete dub you should just immediately take it as a victory it's awesome that's awesome that they say that all right i get the the closest thing they can say was word salad is when i say that you have a radially inward accelerative uh force it's like if you want to rearrange the words if that makes you feel better whatever it's 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 radially inward. It's an accelerative force. So those words all mean something. All right, cool. So let's open it up. I think what is going to happen is um, I was, I'm was i wanting uh, my boys to, to bring up some more of the other parts of the topics and maybe they can share screen as well as they've been really deep diving into GPS. Um, if you don't know, you should definitely be checking them out. Uh, very good work there. And it is the emperor with no clothes. GPS claim to prove relativity and if relativity wasn't true we couldn't even use gps and gps proves the earth's a globe and that it's spinning and that it's orbiting and that relativity is true and all of those things are patently false so we'll get into more of the specifics as we go uh since you're hidden by youtube i'd say sharing is more important than likes i uh, sure i agree with that all right cool we're gonna go ahead and open it up again there's a link in the description if you want to join the discord um, and if you disagree, then we'll pop you up. You raise your hand, you get brought up. We are going to cover some more of the specifics before we do that. Um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to cover that part of it, the inertial forces and the orbital mechanics themselves, falsifying heliocentrism. All right, cool. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts about that? Relativity proves GPS and GPS couldn't work without relativity <clears throat> is great rhetoric because, when, you know, on the surface level, you can just say that and things are, fa you know, allegedly falling in the sky. So you can just kind of safely assume. Oops, sorry, you're echoing me a little bit. Oh, yeah. Um, so you can just, yeah. So you can just safely assume that because, you know, you have the access to the services of GPS and, and all that, that therefore the correctness of relativity must be true. We need not look any further, right? Well, um, let's see, where should we start here? The clock corrections, the overall system, relative simultaneity. It's like, where do we begin with how relativity doesn't work with this system at all? And classical mechanics completely explained it um, up until... 1995, they didn't even have any relativistic transformations in the entire system, right? And then to this day, right? So what they say is, well, the instrumentation at the time wasn't sens sensitive enough to detect the um, the small differences <clears throat> that general and special relativity would make. So they actually cancel out due to the sensitivity air threshold of our current instruments. So we don't need to worry about implementing any relativistic transformations or anything like that. And we'll just run it off of classical mechanics. Now, they have more advanced instr instrumentation now, and they say that due to the scaling of that, their instruments are more sensitive, so that's where they're going to have to start accounting for these relativistic effects, right? So this is where the, where the retardation that's happening for, with, clink, with clock synchronization or that's happening within the signal propagation that they're sending uh, to ground receivers, right? There is a... Let's see, where were we at? Oh, so the, the retardation that's happening within that has now, um, you know, it has to be, it's more accurate, right? So they're, so to explain the, like the ratio of how small this is getting now, they say, okay, well now it's a relativistic correction. So at this point, the classical effects have stopped and now this is due to a, a gravitational field. This little, this specific amount of retardation is due to the gravitational potential of the geoid, right? And then due to X, Y, Z velocity, now this correction has to be applied, right? They completely, ch or I'm sorry, not not velocity. Due to velocity, now time is slightly different, right? Now there's a time displacement with that's causing retardation. Well, apparent retardation, <laughs> you know. So, really, just depends on your on your reference frame on that if it's apparent or physical or not. But um, in any case, they've it's the same effects, right? That we're working in the classical system but just more sensitive now. And they're, they have newly proposed mechanisms for the, for the cause, for the quote unquote cause of it. Right. So all the math that existed in the system before where it canceled out. So therefore it wasn't relevant or whatever. Right. But now they say, well, now we're using it. Now it's applicable, et cetera, et cetera. 
right? And that's just for that's just in terms of keeping the clocks in sync and in, in uh, using the signal to derive distances, right? So that's not even touching on the dynamic aspect of it, which uh, which we'll get into. But that was just kind of a segue of how the rhetoric around uh, relativity proves GPS. GPS couldn't work without it. It's it's literally the opposite. When you look into how they uh, built the built the system, right? It was basically trial and error. They they assumed Einstein clock synchronization would work. That didn't work. They had you know they had to go back to classical mechanics. Um, so it's just a really interesting story when you know the history of it and it's completely different than when you go to Wikipedia and it says that relativity is proof of GPS. Yeah. Isn't it crazy, man? Like, I mean, like if you go through the list of things and of course anyone, any of you guys can share a screen anytime you want to, I stopped like, um, Alan really broke that down in the, uh, if you're unfamiliar with concepts and stuff like that, like we, uh, we're happy to discuss them. But if you go through the list of things, it's so much. And it's funny because like from the rip, and that's all I covered, was the orbital mechanics, right? Like just the actual orbital mechanics themselves, see, like it, it refutes heliocentrism if it's true. If they're up there doing that, it refutes heliocentrism. And that's probably the most ironic part. So if you see here, Alan is showing, let me pop it up, there you go. Alan's showing the the path over top of a a plane. Uh, okay, you can take it away. Yeah. So real quick, before we get to the orbital paths and how that falsifies relativity, we'll talk about the atomic clock that's inside of these crafts, whatever they are, and how that also falsifies that, and another aspect of that falsifies relativity. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is the old atomic clock here, and the magic happens in this chamber. We'll go over it quickly. So to kind of instead of thinking about this in the way that they try and teach it through the atomic model and valence electrons and all that, right? Just kind of think of it in, in basic terms. So everything is going to be a frequency related. So it's going to be related to an oscillation rate. So vibrations per second, right? So we have a cesium oven here, and if you heat cesium up, it gets excited and it oscillates, right? It starts vibrating at nine billion one hundred ninety-two million oscillations a second. So they start heating up cesium. This is a vacuum chamber here, right? So they have cesium, they break the cesium in its oven, and then they start heating it up. And then this, the excited cesium gets funneled out through a collimator. So it's basically just, you know, finally focusing out uh, the gas vapor. And then that hits a magnetic field. Any oscillations that are not uh, 9 billion or 9.192 gigahertz, it'll just, it'll bounce it out. And the oscillation rate that matches will pass through and enter the radio wave, what do they call it? The radio microwave chamber. And what they'll do here is they'll inject microwaves in and to get the frequency of those microwaves to match the oscillation rate of the of the vapor of the gas, of the cesium vapor, right? So once they have an oscillation rate of the microwaves at 9,192,000,000 matching the cesium of the same value, it exits the chamber, or the and it, there's another magnetic field here. Anything that's oscillating above or below that gets bounced in its appropriate direction. And anything that's of the correct oscillation rate that that's maintaining that 9,192,000,000 uh, oscillations per second hits a ionizer. When it gets ionized, that energy gets sent over here and it gets converted into an electric signal. This quote unquote electron multiplier is just, uh, like bouncing a, an electric signal back and forth with these mirrors to amplify the signal. And once they do that, they get a reading. And th when the signal is proportional to an oscillation rate of 9,192,000,000 uh, oscillations per second, they lock that in uh, on the, what do you call it, in the, in, the, uh, in the radio wave chamber so that it keeps like the same output on a loop essentially, right? So the way that Einstein clock synchronization works in theory, right, once they got this clock synchronized, we don't have to get into the details of the full process itself, but the theory is once this gets synchronized and we have an, uh, a satellite free-falling around the Earth in a local inertial frame, now because the speed of light is constant, it's not good. This clock should maintain its oscillation rate. It should be, it should, it should, it should not experience any retardation, meaning that the oscillation rate should not decrease. It should be, it should maintain, right? So what they found actually 
was that the oscillation rate retards exactly proportional to the craft's velocity. So if we recall back to free falling in space, that is, you know, in inertial frame, it's a geodesic, all these things, right? You can't detect it. There's no reference frame. You're in space. How would you ever know? The speed of light's the same. You'd have no way to tell. Well, it turns out that when this clock is free falling around the Earth, as they say, right, in their model, with respect to nothing, the oscillation rate changes proportional to the velocity of the craft and they have to actually send additional energy into this radio wave cavity to compensate to that to keep the oscillation rate at 9 billion 192 millionths of a, of a second right because that's that's what this whole process is about it's to break a second into one or 9 billion 192 millionths of a second now anyway they got this clock free falling around the Earth. Now, in relativity theory, like we were talking about earlier with the orbits and all that, you're free falling around a geodesic, it's linear, blah, blah, blah. You can't detect it. Well, clock retards proportional to that. And in addition to that, um, so from our reference frame on the Earth, if we're looking at a satellite free falling around us, that's actually not its true path, right? Because every path is a geodesic around space time curvature. So there's actually a different universal reference frame that the motion of the craft would actually be experiencing, you know, if relativity were true in any case. So if you actually were to look at the uh, look at that orbit from another planet, like Mars, for example, you would you wouldn't see the elliptical path. You would see it being what's called a cycloid, like a like a more in and out orbit, which would have different acceleration and deceleration periods to it. And the, so what that means is, is that the clock retardation would be different and it would correspond to the reality version of relativity where everything's in a geodesic and there's an actual different reference frame that you could only see from another perspective outside of it, blah, 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 right? But that's not the case at all. It retards proportionally to a geocentric position, right? Exactly as we see it. So that's extremely damning for relativity theory because this, that, that's the theory that was actually brought in to explain the fact that they couldn't detect uh, linear motion when they were trying to measure the orbit around the sun. But that's kind of outside of the scope of this presentation, but all very related. Nice. If you have any questions as we go through this stuff, just ask in the chat. Um, so atomic clocks, which is hilarious because... Uh, that's what they claim proves it almost, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, so atomic clocks in and of itself, they say, are a successful proof of relativity theory. But real quick, if we can diverge to the, one of the clock synchronization um, experiments that's said to actually be confirmation of relativity theory, the boys Heffel and Keating, right? If we remember them. They took four atomic clocks around the equator on an airplane going eastward and then westward, right? So the clocks were, had certain predictions in accordance with relativity theory in regards to how the clocks would respond to the equigravitational potential of the geoid. Sorry, I get really amped when I say that now because yeah, it's geodetic astro <laughs> from astrogeogenic <laughs> surveying. So it's, All right, it's, real fast, it's, let's make sure everyone knows this is that people will claim that GPS proves relativity and that the atomic clocks have to account for time dilation and that without the relativistic corrections, we wouldn't be able to use it. And that that proves that relativity is correct. And they point to this quote unquote experiment, this measurement that supposedly happened where they put clocks on planes that went different directions. They flew at different altitudes in different directions and they were supposed to show different uh, t time dilation rates based on relativity's predictions and continue. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that was the that was the experiment. So they had their clocks. They had their relativistic prediction on how much the clocks would would retard or gain speed proportional to the gravitational potential, right? And the results of the experiment were published in 1971. Well, they weren't really published in 1971. There was they were documented in 1971, and then later FOIAed by a, a man named A. G. Kelly, who was looking into the matter. But anyway. Uh, this entire experiment was funded by uh, by the Navy, so they were doing a debriefing afterwards, and this is from Heffel um, going on or talking about the the experiment and what happened during it, right? Because during the experiment, the clocks came out of synchronize uh, came out of predicted desynchronization and synchronization, or uh, you know, plus or minus, right? So gaining or or losing time, it 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 varied so much outside of the experimental threshold that they had to adjust the clocks manually. They did this. I forget the amount of times, but um, you know, just that, just the fact that it happened once is kind of game over, right? But they had to make like seven adjustments or something like that. 
uh, to reset these things. But anyway, they say here, the result of the analysis are in reasonable agreement with the theoretical predictions. However, those who doubt the validity of the conventional relativity theory, and there are many people who people in this category will probably not be converted by the results shown in figure four. Indeed, the difference between theory and measurement in figure four is disturbing and our final analysis does not improve the agreement of the improved version in this experiment should be given a serious consideration, right? Or an improved, an improved version, right? So what they did was the predicted values are here in this slide, right? So it was supposed to lose 43 nanoseconds plus or minus 23 nanoseconds going eastward. And then it was supposed to gain uh, 275 nanoseconds plus or minus 21 on the westward trip for the relativity theory. Now the measurements on the first on the first round, not including the clock resets to keep everything in alignment, were not even close. And then in 1972, they published their paper or they published their findings as proof of relativity, giving good agreement with clock synchronization um, with their corrected results. And they never published like what they did for their corrections or anything like that. They just you know you can get the paper and read it yourself. But anyway, a man named A. G. Kelly, like I said, physicist. Uh, from Ireland, uh, FOIA'd, the, FOIA'd this uh, this whole thing, right? So this is from the debrief from, from that when they got back from the from the plane trip. So didn't atomic clocks did not in 1972 prove relativity theory at all or give substantial evidence that couldn't be explained through any uh, like a different mechanism, right? So all right, so that's atomic clocks. Uh, was there anything else we needed to talk about? I mean, I guess there's, like, a, there's a million things. Someone say something? <laughs> yeah, I was going to be a good and be like, how come I just can't Lorenz contract and apply to the corrections wherever I am? <laughs> yeah. Wilbur's aren't, aren't even saying anything like that. Let's be real. I mean, dog yeah. said exactly that. <laughs> oh, really? That they, yeah. that they can't do that. Nice. All right. So let's see here. Okay, we can go to... We can cover the principle of relative simultaneity, right? So we were kind of talking meta arguments in terms of the dynamics of the solar systems and the motions of the things in the sky in relation to things that are moving on Earth. And another meta argument against relativity theory and GPS, right? Because we were talking about earlier how the rhetoric around GPS is that uh, relativity th or, uh, GPS wouldn't work unless relativity were correct, right? So we're going to read about relative simultaneity real quick, which is the core fundamental tenet really of relativity theory, because if this doesn't exist, then link contraction and time dilation can't be like, are not valid explanations for anything. And the justification to even use a Lorentz transformation to say link contraction and time dilation is completely invalidated by this, because <clears throat> from our perspective, right, we experience Link their length contraction and time dilation are explained to us as physical mechanisms, right? But they're actually they will <laughs> they'll actually argue that they're apparent due to relative simultaneity and et cetera, right? So we're gonna read a little bit about that here as soon as I can transition to the right slide and the relevance of that in GPS. So all right, so I'm gonna close this out and we're going to do it from the paper. One second, sorry about that. You're good, brother. So, wang. Okay. Dude, I'm just thinking, like, I can, dude, we can create a totally functional model for all the dynamics in the sky, like, because Whoa. the center of a magnetic field is the null pressure point. It's like the pure potential. That would be the thing that uh, you have, uh, you know, basically centrifugal divergence, centripetal convergence, con like the, <laughs> I'm just going to say it where, where people that are, not just trying to dismiss it, can understand it, who cares? You have centrifugal divergence, centripetal convergence, like superimposed, right? You have that conjugate geometry. That's centered on the center of the Earth. You're gonna start getting the effects of the motion as you get out there. You'll even start getting counter rotation effects. And then everything moving around that would have such an immense angular momentum. It would basically press in towards that null pressure point and it would just keep everything moving around it forever. Meaning like literally the center of the Earth right is this the center of the surface of the earth would be the center of the entire universe's torus field all right anyway yeah that's an awesome thought man we're definitely gonna have to make an uh, make a cool model of that 
How dare you so, provide an actual dynamic explanation for things? For the whole universe? Yeah. <laughs> Who needs that? You can make All a right. separate model for each like we do and then have all everything. All right. So we're going to quickly go over global simultaneity and the rel- and relative simultaneity here. So this is from a paper in 2000 by Ru Yang Wang. Shout out to Wang. So we'll read here what he has to say about it. In any debate about the speed of light, the problem of simultaneity is always a focus. Special relativity claims that rel- that relativity of simultaneity, which states that two events occurring at two different places, which are viewed as simultane- simultaneous for an observer in a system, usually will not be simultaneous if viewed from another uh, viewed from an observer in another system. But oops, went too far. But contrary to this, simultaneity is key to GPS operations. Oh, no way. The thing that would, would, would not make it true is key to it, huh? Well, let's keep reading. GPS is a timing ranging system. It does not directly measure distance between two places where two events, i.e. signal transmitting and signal receiving, occur. It measures the difference in the instance when these two events happen and the distance is calculated using the range measurement equation. GPS, especially its space segment and control segment, make a huge effort to establish and maintain GPS time or simply or, yeah, GPS system time or simply GPS time. In a scope where GPS is applied, roughly a scope of a di- diameter of 50,000 kilometers or bigger, if one is using GPS, one is using GPS time and therefore the concept of simul- simultaneity of GPS, i.e. so just regular simultaneity. If, if uh, two events happened at two different places, and then the coordinate system for event number one is given, and the coordinate system for event number two is given, are simultaneous if the time is equal to the time in the second coordinate system. And this is true no matter who the receiver is, where the receiver is, what the, what its status is, or what speed it is. This is the basic operational principle of GPS. We call it global simultaneity. So they've got a special term here that isn't called relative simultaneity it's called global simultaneity so we'll get back to that in a second here so in the books about special relativity the most commonly cited example about the principle of of relative simultaneity is that the is the example of a railway platform and a moving train it says that these two events uh two strokes of lightning a and b which are simultaneous if the with the reference frame to, or with reference to the platform are not simultaneous with ref or with respect to the moving train and vice versa, but now GPS receivers have been utilized extensively on railway platforms and moving trains and two and at and at and lightning at two different places A and B conceptually is the same or is the same as the emission of two GPS signals from the satellite or two D GPS signals or stations. The fact that two signals are emitted from two satellites and two D or two D G E P S stations at the same time, at the same GPS time, both of the GPS receiver on the railway and the moving uh, train car would acknowledge the two events. The mission, the emission signals would be simultaneous. Without this basic acknowledgement, GPS would not function at all. So we have here. Uh, uh, let me just uh, say here <clears throat> like yeah. like to those in the chat look there's always going to be these weirdos that are trolling and i i'm very pro free speech so as long as you're not spamming we have it on slow mode that's cool to the mods like it's cool but obviously this information is going to require attention so i encourage people in the in the chat to like try to pay attention at with questions about it the, the trolls in here that are saying, they oh, you can't answer anything, you have no answers for anything, like, they're just coping. We're answer, we, we answer almost everything, right? So, like, just ignore the trolls and pay attention. Uh, that's just my suggestion, obviously. You also have free speech, whatever you want. Sorry to pause it, but just saying that, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm about to go uh, refill my drink, but I just wanted to tell the mods, like, leave them alone, but also people, like, just don't give them an energy because we're, we're ladling gravy. And I would say if you're not familiar with what Alan's talking about, it probably is going to require some attention. So, okay. Sorry about that, bro. Go ahead. Yeah, no worries. So the idea here is that relativity or the principle of relative simultaneity states that you, you wouldn't be able to sync multiple events to a cohesive, to a single timeline, to a single cohesive timeline. What that's exactly how GPS functions through GPS time. So 
everyone gets the signal at the same time and it all works out with no additional corrections, right? So this is a huge, huge problem because like I said earlier, this is the proposed mechanism for why time and distances are different. And that's where they get into link contraction and time dilation, right? As the proposed mechanisms to facilitate why the speed of light, you know, is a constant, right? In their in their model. So we're gonna look at this paper here from 1995. This is GPS and Relativity and Engineering Overview. Right. So this is the response to like I was talking about earlier. I, I didn't have the paper up, I apologize. But this is in response to all the engineers that work in GPS, especially the software engineers that are out there programming things. And, you know, they're they're trying to figure out what corrections they need to make to make the system accurate. Right. And there was actually an initiative after they got the system working pretty good. You know, this is in the night. This is 19, 19, 1995. This paper actually touches on some initiatives that were put forward to increase the accuracy of the system, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So this is what I was talking about earlier, though, when I said that they said, well, special and general relativity basically cancel out. Our instruments aren't sensitive enough. You don't need to worry about the corrections, blah, blah, blah. Right. So we'll skip here. Oop, one second. Accidentally deleted a highlight, I think. I mean, never mind. All right. We'll skip here to the gravy at the end regarding relative simultaneity. So we have Carol Alley here who's chiming in about GPS, has a, has a quick Quick question. Now, quick note on Carol Alley. This is a person who did a second Heffalan Keating type atomic clock experiment, and they actually got Einstein clock synchronization to last for about 14 hours before it completely failed. So, shout out to them for putting in the good try. Anyway, uh, we have their final notes here on this on this paper, and they said and and that if one perhaps does the explicit recognition of the special relativistic effects, I mean, it took a long time to get general relativity down properly, but I think that, that it is more or less correct now. But its absence of any explicit acknowledgement of special relativistic effects due to the speed of light being the same whenever measured by an observer, leading to the relativity of simultaneity and the, and the associated Lorentz transformation, there is nothing of that modeled in the current system, and I think it should be. Thank you. So shout out to Carol Alley for being so polite and saying, like, hey, we don't incorporate anything that proves the core tenet of what we believe in mathematically because it's not necessary. Um, and I think that we should incorporate it, even though up until this point, it's not required at all. Thank you. Can you I mean, can you even be mad at the at the guy for being that polite? <laughs> Shouldn't we prove the thing we believe in? No? Okay, cool. <laughs> like, shouldn't we do that? All right, cool story, but, Shane. Yeah. So that's uh, that's extremely damning for them. This is the key principle of why there would be a Lorentz transformation in the first place to, to even a, attempt to explain uh, anything in, in, with a Lorentz transformation. So anything that requires time dilation or length contraction is out the window. It's not even on the table. Any questions, well comments, done, concerns? Very well done. I don't have a uh, yeah, hand clap, golf clap. I don't have soundboard. Golf clap. Any like lubers? They always like spout this stuff when we're not around or like to talk about it when we can't hear them, but now's a good time. And now's a good time. Yeah, any any questions, opposition, anything um doesn't matter. We have, you know, any anything that needs to be explained, we can definitely do it. So, I'll check the chat now see if anyone has any questions. Ooh, anyone got any gotcha you want to throw at us? Come on. I know you guys love that. Just just to get you up here. Can you break that down for a fourth grader, please? It doesn't do anything they said it does, and then they said it doesn't need to. Perfect, thank you. And they said that the fact that it doesn't need to is actually proof that they're correct the whole time. That's the best part. <laughs> that's that, that's God, the that's the that's the tricky part. That's that's the part a lot of people forget is the fact that it wasn't there at all is proof that they were right the whole time. Yeah, now you're better for it. Exactly. Yeah, they do the they do the trick to cover up the fact that classical mechanics are being accounted for. And they just call it relativity. Yeah. Call it proof. Let's see. There was another paper I had. Let's see if I got that. Got that up still. 
we can dive into that a little bit. Yes, we have a modern paper here from 2013. I don't have any highlights for it yet. I just read it once, but basically this guy was going over how he, so this is so keep in mind the paper we just went over with the relative simultaneity, et cetera, and the other relativistic corrections, which are just correcting for smaller increments of classical effects. Um, this guy is saying that even even the new stuff they added doesn't it's not <laughs> it's not proof of relativity. Twenty thirteen. So just, they got nothing. It's a like the the system completely falsifies the premise of of their explanations. So. Yeah, and just a just a reminder, uh, anyone that's thinking that we're wrong about this, all you have to do is pop up on the stream, raise your hand, and we'll talk to you about it. You can show us why we're wrong or what we're misunderstanding as opposed to basically claiming that we're wrong or changing the subject to what last week's stream was about. Uh, I find it odd that you guys will turn around and say that GPS proves relativity and debunks flat Earth, but then we'll avoid all of the arguments that directly refute that. Um, that seems dishonest so I'm inviting all you guys to pop on in a minute so we can maybe have a lobby discussion but I do have glasses ready don't worry I can be a glober <laughs> yeah well let's worry. go let's go over the cor corrections that they say they make now like the uh, the current ones right because they say well this paper's from 2000 as well so in 2000 they were saying that they had to correct for what was it so they make three they make three corrections, right? They say that they and they, or this is how they have them classified, right? Because they're we're they've passed classical mechanics, right? We're on relativistic mechanics now, as they say. So the way that they treat this, their corrections, they say that we're going to make a general relativity correction, and they say that this is due to the satellite free falling around the Earth and the gravitational potential, like the gravitational strength of Earth at this altitude that they're free falling around, right? is retarding the clock. Okay, it's making it oscillate a little slower. So they have to apply this correction relative to that altitude. And then they say, okay, well, the Earth's rotating under us, so we have to account for that for some reason. So they have a special relativity correction. This is a velocity correction, right? So general relativity is a gravitational... Um, or a gravitational field theory, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's what it's about, right? Gravi gra gravity fields. And then special relativity is a velocity theory. It's about motion. So they have their motion uh, correction here for quote-unquote Earth rotation in regards to a satellite orbiting, right? So that's the other correction. And then they have a third correction that they call a sagnet correction. This correction, however is not the same type of correction that they would normally apply for a velocity or anything like that. This is a coordinate system rotation that they do, and it's actually different from a Lorentz boost, right? So a Lorentz boost would be, we're all familiar with in contraction time dilation. This is a Lorentz rotation, and it's where you invert the time and distance axis. So they're basically just adjusting... Um, <laughs> It, it, uh, in my opinion, they're uncorrecting for Earth rotation. That's not there. Yikes! Is the yeah? So that that guy A. G. Kelly that I was talking about earlier, who did who investigated all of this thoroughly, right? So he started writing the International Clock Standard Institutions, and he got and he, about these Sagnet corrections. And he has them on record. And this is kind of anecdotal, right? Because these are just like letter exchanges between him and, the, and these people, right? But they're on record saying, yeah, these aren't relativistic corrections at all. Which is a huge problem. And like the, at the base of it, maybe just to mention, like, it's based on range measurement. And that means that it's one signal that's sent, and that signal has an encoded... Uh, has an encoded GPS time essentially, and it's based on the distance traveled from the one satellite to the other. And so then, when that other satellite receives that signal and does the decoding that was encoded into the uh, <clears throat> to the electromagnetic propagation, essentially, it's it's like a 
my understanding is that it's like a like like a um such a like a pulse but in any case when it gets decoded on the other end that decoding is then used to determine the range and so that's based on the propagation rate, how much time it took for the light to, tra to travel. And that has to be accounted. This is all accounted for in that equation as well. So like it's, it's not like it's just like all post corrections. Like it's literally in the way that it works is a violation of GP or a violation of relativity because you're counting for uh, when they do that, when that synchronous or when that decoding happens and it does its math there, it has to account for. I, I mean, that's like literally how it determines the range is how much time it took there. And it has to. And that's uh, the velocity of the receiving satellite is fully uh, included in that velocity. It's just it's a violation of relativity. If a Glober doesn't show up, bro, I'm ready to like step in. But I really hope a Glober, please, guys, yeah. one Glober show up, please, guys. Good, good, good. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So. Here's the kicker, right? We just went over three different types of ge rel general relativity corrections. Well, Alan, doesn't that mean relativity is true? Well, as Paul Marmot points out here, the gravitational potential correction, the Earth road, quote unquote, Earth rotation correction, um, all are equivalent to equation thirteen. What's equation thirteen? Oh no, is it is it the classical? Uh, <laughs> Is it is it the way you would derive the Sagnik effect classically? Yep, it is. <laughs> oh, no way. So there's actually no way to distinguish between what physical mechanism is causing this retardation other than, you know, velocity retarding proportional to a medium it's traveling through. Um, that's my take on it. But anyway. Which to clarify for there, everyone that doesn't understand, that is classical mechanics with the medium. There's some type of motion. And that's not supposed to be the case within a relativistic framework. Um, so basically, you have to hijack reality again, use a stationary lab frame, use velocity in relation to that affecting it. So the proportional velocity effect is exactly like it would be on a stationary Earth with a drift in an ether, but none of that's actually there, I promise. Yeah, so good game, man. We had a we had a good game, and it's it was well played. And relativity is over now. We're now in a post Einstein world. We do not era. live in a coordinate <laughs> system. Yeah, era. We we don't live in a space time coordinate system. Right. Of all and the, the speed of, and the speed of light is plus or minus v does not equal the speed of light. I think of all the proofs that violate relativity. This is the one that most people lose their career over, sort of, or like figure it out over. Yeah, so speaking useful. Yep. It's uh, I think it's helpful to realize too that when they go to do an explanation of the Sanyak effect in an interferometer, like what Sanyak, what George S. Sanyak himself, when he spun the interferometer and he got that measurement of the uh, of the fringe shift, um, they literally to try and have a physical explanation for that, they they end up like doing a Lorentz transform in their math. So they're telling you that, you know, you saw the direct proportional velocity be uh, show up in the fringe shift of the interferometer. Even though you saw that direct measurement, that's not what actually happened. And they tell you that, you know, if you just have to step out of the out of out of reality and then you would be in the proper reference frame to see what really happened and the speed of light was actually constant. And there was a, you know, time and space warped. And that's why you got the result that you got on your, uh, in your friend shift, which it, I, I can't even explain that without sound like, without feeling like I'm saying it wrong. Cause it's mm -hmm, so stupid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Isn't it such um, a reoccurring theme that what we see keeps exactly matching a specific framework and position over and over and over and directly contradicts another assumed framework or model and yet we don't just accept what the evidence says we do mental gymnastics through mathematics to always hijack the stationary earth and turn it into some fairy tale how wild is that it, such a reoccurring theme it, you see the same trick happen with that they, they they do that morph to what they end up doing is like you know you slip into this geometrically convenient position in the center of everything and they do it with the little interferometer when they try to explain 
Saniac rotating his little interfer his interferometer, they slip themselves into a geometrically convenient position from which they can observe the speed of light being constant uh, in, in all frames. But it's just a, a convenient frame that they invoke that they they can't substantiate. Well, they made and it they up. Do the math, they do the math from that point, and then it's it's just interesting because when you once you see that, and then you go back to this stuff, the GPS stuff, and you start looking at what they're doing when they go from ECEF to ECI, and you say, oh, they're doing the same thing here. They're slipping into their geometrically convenient position to then make the speed of light constant and do their math there, and then they can slip back out and say, oh, every, all's good. Look at magic tricks done. You know, wipe your hands. Yeah. You're well said, they, Toby. That's yeah, exactly absolutely. it. <laughs> but they created ECI specifically for that. It's not like they had this other convenient system that was already in use for a very good reason, right? They were like, hmm, that varying speed of light is really kicking our ass. You know, you know what we got to do? You get rid of that. So uh, let's invent a whole new quarter system. We'll do all of our math in there. We'll convince <laughs> everyone that's where they live. And then we'll, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. It'll, it'll, it'll be fine. Dude, You're good. They, <laughs> that's hilarious, bro. So... Real quick, let's go over signal propagation from these satellites to ground receivers, right? Let's see what Daniel Garzi has to say. And then D Daniel Garzi currently works at NASA. He, when he published this, so this is experimental basis for special relativity in the photon sector, right? So let's see what he has to say about rel uh, relativity in the photon sector. So one of the most familiar arguments for the validity of special relativity is that the global positioning system, GPS, navigation system, would not achieve a high degree of accuracy without making special relativistic corrections. The principal, the principal correction cited for, or cited is a first order timing adjustment to compensate for signal propagation of very, or uh, signal propagation time variations arising from motions of satellite to the ground receiver and the local Earth-centered Earth. Uh, fixed frame frame due to the Sagnac effect. But the Sagnac effect is purely a classical first order effect that has been somehow incorrectly reclassified in its application as a special relativistic effect by Alan Weiss and Ashby in 1985 and then 2000. Anyway, this guy went on tour after their experiment and said that GPS's proof of relativity and Sagnac and Sagnac corrections prove uh, prove that, and we'll get into the difference between the Sagnac effect and the Sagnac correction here in a second. So, so for first order timing correction to be made for for accurate performance of the GPS system, just the amount attributable to the velocity component of the satellite constellation along the line of sight in the ECF frame, the fact that the first order timing correction is required at all is in direct conflict with special relativity. Wolf and Pettit in 1997 tested the isotropy for the one-way speed of light by analyzing the GPS network timing signal database and found no discrepancy with the sound or with the source to receiver motion, which they interpreted as evidence that the speed of light was isotropic, meaning that it was constant, you know, in, in agreement with relativity theory. However, Wolf and Pettit noted that the data that they analyzed had been pre-processed and corrected for the Sagnac effect. In this case, a first order change to the time of flight of a radio signal between satellite and receiver. The justification for making this correction is claiming that the Sagnac effect was a relativistic effect of the second order in C and therefore is, uh, and therefore that the correction had a negligible consequence in their analysis. But the correction that was made was a first order in the velocity component in, of the line of sight between the satellite and the group receiver or ground receiver in the ECEF frame. Thus, while the effect of the first order line of sight velocity component of the GPS satellite is clearly evident in the raw timing data or raw signal data, the first order timing component had been removed from the data set that Wolf and Pettit had analyzed to show that C was isotropic. Yikes, bro. Yikes. Let's just Dude. really, let's soak this in for a second. Hey, hey guys, guys, forget the trolls. Let's, I want to make sure everyone gets this. All right, so they went to analyze some GPS data, and what they saw was that it had already been corrected. It was supposed to be raw data, but it had already been corrected, right? Yikes. And so they did a Sagnac effect correction, <laughs> and then they had, when, I guess when asked about it, are pressed about it or when they dug further either way 
they say, oh, well, it was negligible because it's just a, it's a relativistic effect and it was in the second order. Therefore, Wait. it was negligible. It had negligible consequences in their analysis. And then it says, but the correction that was made was first order in the velocity component of the line of sight between each satellite and the ground receiver in the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed frame. I read, I read that off. Was it Wolf and Pettit who found it, or was it the dude who investigated them who found they didn't find it or whatever? Was it the other guy, Marmot? Well, well, it says it says like, well, it says that they and and justified making this correction by claiming. So how? Oh, yeah, yeah. So. So they, they had to make a baseless claim, right? Because the Sagnac effect obviously is a force order effect, meaning that if you introduce rotation into a system, that the um, the retardation that the speed of light experiences will be proportional exactly to that velocity, right? So this is, this is a first order effect. It's not a second order of a relativistic effect in C. That's, 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 that's actual word salad, right? <laughs> like, that's insane. <laughs> that's, not even, that's not even close to what it could be classified as. That's actually like an ad hoc, hey, I hope nobody looks into this, and they just read the cover page, and it just reads that we found that the speed of light is isotropic, right? Because the fact that they made these corrections and, the, and they didn't immediately go, oh, you know what? We actually can't use this data set. It completely invalidates what we were trying to do. No, no, no. They went ahead and said, no, not only is it not invalidate our position, the, the fact that it's corrected is, is no big deal because of, of an excuse that we're going to make up. Right, so let's just make sure, I want to make sure everyone gets this here. They went and tried to find, look at the raw GPS data. It had already been corrected. So the data being portrayed as raw data had already been corrected for the very specific effect that wasn't supposed to be there according to relativity. They correct it and then claimed it was raw as if to portray that the raw data matches the relativistic predictions when in fact the raw data did not, it had to be corrected. And then they say, to try to justify, they say, oh, it's negligible because reasons, and the reasons are trash and incoherent nonsense and just wrong when it says it's in the second order. Okay, so just that right there, a truth seeker should be like, red flag, red flag, red flag. <laughs> I'm gonna say it one more time. They tried to go look at raw GPS data and the data being portrayed as raw, turns out it was actually already corrected and then portrayed as if the raw data. And it, the part that was corrected is an effect that should not have been there. And specifically, it's an anisotropic effect, which is a preferred direction. And the signal should not have a preferred direction. That's why it then says, but the correction that was made was first order in the velocity component of the line of sight between each satellite and the ground receiver in the ECF. The line of sight path from the satellite to the receiver in the Earth-centered Earth fixed frame had a velocity component that was anisotropic. Thus, while the effect of the first order line of sight velocity component of the GPS satellites is clearly evident in the raw timing signal data, so you mean the real data? This first order component had been removed from the data set that Wolf and Petit analyzed to show that C was isotropic, meaning has no preferred direction, it's constant in all directions, i.e. what relativity would predict. So they had to actually fudge the raw data. And this is this goes into, and I'm really trying to drive this home to make sure everyone gets it. This goes into what Jaren always talks about. It's like, well, this stuff is classified, the most accurate, it's like not closed source. Even the raw data people think that they're getting in the, op the allegedly open source stuff is clearly being messed with before you even get what's called uh, I saw someone saying that's something messed up. Before you even get to what's called uh, the raw data. So does that that should ring, like, that's a big red flag, huh? <laughs> so anyway, I think, I think I said it where everyone understands it. The raw data showed that the signal had a preferred direction. It had a velocity correction. It went faster in one direction, but relativity says it should go the same speed, the same velocity in all directions, should have no preferred direction. So what did they do? They subtly corrected the data and then portrayed it as raw, but got caught doing it. Okay.
So yeah, and it's not this, like they were satellites that are. Are you saying they're changing speed in their orbit? Holy so they're having to fucking do a speed hell! Correction. Sorry about the. Correction. Bro, bro, bro! You can't, you can't cuss like that. Just in the middle of someone talking. I just said I'm sorry. Okay. Um. It's a G. It's GPS data. The we just yeah. read it. We just covered it three times. Yeah, I'm just wondering. Like, is this the idea? Of GPS is the claim. I guess is that it's going around the Earth. Okay, we're not doing that. Some, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. Some doing. parts in there. We're not doing that. We're not, not doing, doing that. What? We're not doing the you try to take over the conversation with some random other point. We're not doing that. The same point. I just want no, to it's not. The point, the point, no, not. are you, no, no. The point is a no. first or second order correction based on the anisotropic distribution of the signal. If you want to talk about the anisotropic velocity correction in the first order that applied to the raw data, then we'll talk about that. We're not going to randomly divert to eggshells once to use soft and talk about something else. We're not talking about oh, if satellite. We're not talking about, about if the Ursa cool. ball, if the satellites are going around anything. We're talking about the signal itself. Do you understand? The signal goes from the GPS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the signal is measuring a difference in speed. Yeah. Right, based on a specific direction. It has a difference in speed okay. based on a speed. So anisotropic yeah. means preferred direction. Relativity says. And where is it going? In which direction? One second. It's not not all, just a quick clarification. Not only is there a directional component where there's a plus or minus to the speed of light, but also it's proportional to the velocity of the receiver, right? So if the receiver is moving at fifty miles an hour, et cetera, right, right there I'll will see. be a very there will be a variance measured in it with the range measurement equation. So that's actually what was what's being covered up in those corrections that uh, Wolf and Pettit or Petit were looking at there. Like that's all what they're sweeping up as a quote unquote Sagnac effect. And they're just saying, oh, you know, the old Earth rotation, right? They just broad stroke sweep up the whole thing because the distance so, is derived is actually a, a major part of the issue as well. Because like I said, it's a range measurement equation. So there so should be no further the correction on the Earth making a correction because sometimes it might be kind of closer to it sometimes it might be further and sometimes it's going faster and sometimes it's going slower relativity says it shouldn't matter how fast it's going or what direction it's going it should just be the same right that's the point the, the point of the point is that they they went and just tried to analyze raw data and they discovered yeah. that the data that was being portrayed as raw actually had already had corrections applied to it specifically for proportional velocity of a sagnac effect that shouldn't have been there according to relativity they corrected it and then just portrayed it as if the raw data matched the relativistic predic prediction when it specifically did not. So this is what I was curious about that I was hoping you would answer. Is the suggestion that the satellites aren't there and this is evidence of that or that they are there and they're no, giving this and this shows that relativity is bunk because they're having to make this correction? No, yeah. Wow. That, that, the, the, ar else? the argument is, I said at the beginning, which is it's important, I think, if the Globers want to come in to school and Globers, it'd be great if... They watch the presentation before I open it up. That would be great. But I explained sure. that at the very beginning, we're just going to grant the satellites, and I'm Why and we're actually going to show that, that we're actually going to show that if those satellites are up there, they refute heliocentrism ironically, and everyone oh. just knows to repeat propaganda phrases such as GPS satellites prove relativity. They have to correct for time dilation. So I went through all kinds of orbital mechanics and the specifics of that. So we're, we're discussing it as though the data is real. Nothing about a satellite proves that the Earth is a spinning ball anyway. So we're just talking about the cover-up that's going on for relativity and how the evidence shows that relativity is incorrect, which means the Earth cannot be moving. So, if if it is all fake, well, it's all fake. But then they're faking the, the faked stuff. Sure, that yeah, that's kind of why I was asking it. Like, yeah, that, that's why why I wasn't sure because it seems like if we're making an argument about if I were making an argument about how fast something was traveling. And when and questions like that. It's necessary that I have an oh, argument for making a bro. conclusion. Okay. We're going to go back to the productive parts of the convo. And I know I'm like impatient with you, but it's like, I want, it's like right when I was, it's like you were, you were hired or something, right? When I had like laid it out like four different ways in very simple terms to make sure that everyone in my proximity could fully understand it. 
and I wanted to make sure everyone in the audience could truly understand it, it got trampled on. So like, can you please just like respect whatever the specific subject is? I mean, I think you may have thought you were doing that. I don't like know. But the subject is satellite data. And I'm it, saying, are the satellites there? What are they doing? I think that's- th That is, no, no. We're not talking about are satellites there? What are they doing? We're talking about the not? proportional velocity of the signal, XLs. Right, but if we need to know where they are to know what that proportional velocity is talking about, how can we I, I either respect what I just said or I'm gonna going. mute you? How about that? Do we know the speed they're going? You're just, so you're just what I'm saying. You see, like you have no respect for the show, bro. It's you about have, proportional. Velocity. Every time you're on here, you have no okay. respect for the show. You just think that like it's your show, and we're gonna talk about what Eggshells wants to, but we're not. We're going through actual specific papers and data. And we're gonna address the thing that destroys your belief system without yeah. skipping over it, pretending it's not there, and then talking about something else, please. Okay, so it's, it's about the velocity. What's, what's its velocity? Yes, bro, like relativity says the signal should be the same period. Doesn't matter what direction the receiver or the, uh, the GPS satellite's moving. Doesn't matter what speed it's going. It should just be the same, okay? I, but, I feel like I'm asking a clear question. If it's about its velocity, I can't do it. I can't do it. Rely on the velocity. What's the velocity? Is it Peace out, bro. Is it Peace out, dog. It was good to have you. Second. You guys really don't answer questions, huh? No, no. You just it, we're just moving on because anyway, I'm hoping that the audience actually understood what I was explaining to you guys, which is this. And then he, you notice he didn't address this, and I've said it four times. And what you'll notice is that none of the trolls in the chat are addressing it either which is to be very telling to everyone here. They purported something to be raw data, but actually that was a lie. It had been corrected. And specifically the part that had been corrected was the part of the data that falsifies relativity, but then it was still proposed to be raw data. So if you then went and saw it, assuming it was truly raw, you'd think, wow, this matches relativity but it had actually been corrected to match the relativistic prediction when the raw data actually didn't. That is lying, that is deceit, that is what we're discussing, right? Is that the raw data itself falsified relativity and was misrepresented. I, I think it, it bears questioning where that data comes from. If you don't, I would like to know why. Okay. So Why we're going to move on past eggshells. We're not going to talk about with it. Yeah, I just would note too on that, that it's hilarious. It's not like they just received the data and they were doing something else with it. And then they happened to notice like, oh, that's interesting. This isn't actually raw data. And they told us that it was. This has corrections. They were like, literally, it was the thing they were going to check for. They were checking for the, the constancy of C. And they received data that had been specifically corrected to show a constant C of C. Exactly, yeah. And that's, that's the point. Anything other than that. Like, cause I started the stream by saying, because this is what they do. It's like, if you talk about flat or if you destroy a globe argument or you something, then they'll be like, but, but sunsets, right? They, they, but that is about flat earth, right? Like, no, it's a red herring. It, we're, I'm granting satellites. I actually proposed a mechanism that would work on a stationary earth for satellites. I already proposed it. I actually said that if they're really up there, they falsify heliocentrism, they prove geocentricity, they account for a change in velocity relative to the center of the ECI. I haven't even got to that. I haven't even got to what the ECI is. I just talked about basic physics and how if you have something moving around a central system, then you're gonna have centrifugal forces and Coriolis forces. The Coriolis forces will be twice the magnitude of the centrifugal forces. So you have a net radially inward accelerative force because it's twice the magnitude, it'll be net. That'll give you angular, that angular momentum will keep something moving perpetually, rotating inward around the central axis. I don't wanna hear any sophistry attempts to get away from what we're talking about. So I addressed it at the beginning, we're gonna grant satellites. I am not, I've never said I know satellites are fake. I don't care if you've heard someone say that. I don't care if that's what you want to straw man. That's not what we're talking about, okay? And I'm, I know I sound aggravated, that's because I am. So it, can, like, can we try to get back onto what we're saying? I, like I laid that down a few times, but so I think we've kind of covered that point, right? And then we've even covered their like ad hoc attempt to explain it away, which is to say that it was just a second order correction. 
Right. Even though it's actually it's, it was actually a first order measurement of velocity, like a proportional velocity relationship. Oh man. Already. Okay. That's what's up, man. Okay. Anyway, I guess I'll bring something up. This, this pisses me off, bro. All right. So, for those that are in denial of this, we'll just cover this real fast. And so let me pop up for you guys. Um, I think the Discord should see it, and then let me come over here. Yeah, we see. All right, cool. And then they should also see it. All right, let's just read this to cover the basics here. Um, as mentioned earlier in this lesson, an object moving in a circle is experiencing an acceleration. Even if moving around the perimeter of the circle with a constant speed, there is still a change in velocity and subsequently an acceleration. This acceleration is directed towards the center of the circle. And in accord with Newton's second law of motion, an object which experiences an acceleration must also be experiencing a net force. The direction of the net force is in the same direction as the acceleration. So for an object moving in a circle, there must be an inward force acting upon it in order to cause its inward acceleration. This is sometimes referred to as a centripetal force requirement. The word centripetal, not to be confused with the F word centrifugal, means center seeking so when i say centripetal convergence well if it was seeking the center it would be converging to the center for objects moving in a circular motion there is a net force acting towards the center which causes the object to seek the center to understand the importance of a centripetal force it is important to have a sturdy understanding of newton's first law of motion the law of inertia the law of inertia states that Objects in motion tend to stay in motion with the same speed and the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. According to Newton's first law of motion, it is the natural tendency of all moving objects to continue in motion in the same direction that they are moving unless some form of unbalanced forces act, some force acts upon the same object to deviate its motion from its straight line path. Moving objects will tend to naturally travel in straight lines and unbalanced force is only required to cause it to turn. Thus, the presence of an unbalanced force is required for objects to move in circles. And this is what I was explaining. I saw some people like trying to deny it ironically, but that's what I was explaining with the graph that I showed you with the centripetal and the centrifugal forces, the, the inertial uh, system of the earth and how Ironically, when you understand that, <laughs> you understand what we've covered about Michelson Morley and how it falsifies Newtonian mechanics, right? You can't, you can't invoke an orbit of the Earth around the sun using Newtonian mechanics ever since Michelson Morley, right? And that's because, of course, you would have been able to detect circular motion. There would be an actual force acting upon the Earth or moving it from a straight line. Einstein came in and said, well, the Earth is actually free-falling in a linear path through the geodesic of bending and warp warping space-time, right? Curvature of space-time. And that's why you can't detect it. So if you, are, if you can put those pieces together with some pattern recognition, you're going to quickly find out that if these GPS satellites are up there utilizing Newtonian mechanics assumption, <laughs> then the Earth has to be stationary. Or it could only be it could only be interpreted as evidence for that. Okay, so and that was me kind of stepping back here, and I have many different sources here. Um, I also have a PDF downloaded from an actual textbook, a physics textbook for university. Uh, let me get here right here. Mm. It's also on Kittle.co. Centripetal force facts for kids. Must be word salad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all, it's, it's all over the place, right? An acceleration must be produced by a force. Any force or combination of forces can cause a centripetal or radial acceleration. So when I say like a radially inward accelerative force, that's not word salad. Just a few examples are the tension in the rope on a tetherball, the force of Earth's gravity on the moon. 
Pseudoscience. Friction between roller skates and a rink floor, a banked Broadway's force on a car, and forces on the tube of a spinning centrifuge. Any net force causing uniform circular motion is called a centripetal force. The direction of a centripetal force is toward the center of curvature, the same as the direction of centripetal acceleration. All right. Um, and I'll drop these sources in my Telegram, but I just wanted to cover that real quick. It's pretty simple stuff. If, if you remember what we covered in the presentation, then you would see like, oh, wow. So these satellites are supposedly going up there and in, in they're uh, mapping out paths that are in ellipse and it has a change in velocity and it accounts for a stationary earth with real inertial forces, Euler, centrifugal and centripetal, specifically Coriolis force. Coriolis has twice the magnitude, which gives you a net Rayleigh inward accelerative force. If that were the case and you had a universe cosmos spinning around a stationary earth, then the angular momentum would generate a net force inward towards the center of what it was rotating around and you could effectively rotate around it perpetually. All you would need is for something to start it. That's all that you would need. So, all right. Um, anyway, so I, I think that, that the last thing that we covered is, is pretty fire though. Cause when you go even further than just the mechanics, like you start to see that the data is, is consistently showing that, and this is why I lean towards, there are definitely things up there, right? Because like, the data is just so damning to them and they're hiding it. Um, you know, but anyway. Uh, so we got another point. Basically, the last thing that we covered, it, so we've covered that atomic clocks, I, I may have missed something when I said the way, but we co covered atomic clocks. They'll claim that atomic clocks have to account for time dilation and GPS proves relativity. And there is guaranteed people in this chat, in this voice call, in the YouTube chat, that will say that right after this is over. If their mic was opened up, they'd say it right now. They'll say it tomorrow, right? But we specifically covered it, and if you wanna know the truth, then you should go and actually listen to what we said, research it, that actually isn't the case. We proved that isn't the case, even with the famous ta test touted to prove it, that wasn't the case. It didn't match relativity. So if you're an honest person, if you're a truth seeker, you would no longer say that. We then covered that the actual raw data has a proportional velocity correction. So an anisotropic correction, meaning based on the direction of velocity that the actual GPS satellite is moving, right? Then you get a certain duration of signal. When relativity specifically says, doesn't matter how fast you're going, doesn't matter what direction that you're going, it's isotropic, it has no preferred direction and it wouldn't be proportional to velocity. And then they actually corrected for a proportional velocity uh, Sagnac effect, <laughs> right, of, of the first order velocity measurement, and they corrected for it and then acted like the data was still raw when it had been corrected specifically for the what falsified relativity and as, as Toby pulled out, pointed out, that they were actually going to look for that very specific part of the data and come to find out that's the part that had been deceptively changed real quick, claimed to be negligible just on baseless grounds, and then still presented as if it was raw. Okay, um, do we have uh, any other specific points you wanna to move towards? Anyone wanna to share their screen or have a specific uh, thing they wanna say? Oh no, nah, you guys crushed it, bro. Um. I was just kind of hoping that a, a Glover was going to come in. That's my only... Yeah, that was my only thing. What's up, Toby? I would say, like, it's interesting because it's evidence of geocentrism, I would say. Like, at least that's, you know, Phyllis, like, when I look at it from my framework, that's what I see it as. I see it as evidence of geocentrism at the very least. And then it also is, it's an equivalence with Flat Earth. And then... Especially once you get into once you once you realize they're doing meridian corrections, uh, and that everything that you know, you look at the fact that all the data that we get is transformed. You know, so between those things, the meridian corrections, and that, and the fact that everything's essentially using a, a center position as their geometrically convenient position, uh, and then you take into account the fact that they have to account for that elliptical orbit. You know, it's it's like it's easy to explain on a flat Earth, and the idea that they wouldn't have something in the sky to ha have control and to have uh, surveillance and that they wouldn't tell us about it like that's crazy of course they, they, at the very least you have to acknowledge that that would be something that they would possibly do but yeah yeah and like actually there's there's uh data 
to suggest that when you really get further south, GPS starts getting a lot trickier, even even like in times of war. So I uh, I really want to compile a lot of that and show that one what, what a shocker the south starts getting sketchy again, and that's where they would be making big meridian corrections. And and one thing that we've just established is they will for sure claim that data is raw after they've corrected it. And, and by the way, this doesn't even require malevolence, right? It doesn't. Like people live in this world where they assume relativity is true. They assume that the Earth's a ball that spins and flies around the sun and therefore assume relativity must be true or it's the best we got so far. So anything that we're going to do, we're going to run it through that lens automatically, like robotically. So it doesn't necessarily require malevolence. Although I think these people have to know what they're doing, right? Whenever they come up with some like ad hoc justification like they did in this situation. But it proves the point that when you really start digging in to try to get to the raw data, they're correcting things off the rip. So why would Meridian corrections be excluded from that possibility, right? Yep. Um, let me read the donations. Well, I don't know what happened. My boy Alan disappeared all right we have yo what's up i'm back what are you good all right what's, what's up good? yeah what afk for a second um right. so real quick on wait the, no, real fast no, let, me, nice. let me read the donations real quick real quick mm -hmm. uh rg the artist hey brother wish i could do more uh but hope your baby girl and your wife are doing well thank you for the 50 dollar tip brother very generous rg the artist thank you man much love uh greatly appreciated brody Fa fowler failure uh, thank you for signing up for the fire tier. Welcome to the Miss Switz. Uh, and if you don't know, you have water, fire, earth, air, ether, five tiers. And stay tuned for, uh, actually, let me see. Uh, I'm going to show, let me show, <laughs> let me show uh, everybody this. Okay, I'm going to go full cam and let me show the Discord. You'll kind of see it won't be that big, but uh, check it out. <laughs> what's up hey. you like space have them stars <laughs> you guys ready baby let's go <laughs> number one fan you're not being recorded don't worry yeah so i got my uh i got a few pairs of glasses they were kind of expensive i got two two pair i got my gear we're ready to go man i'm so excited to go learn about how uh, reality is actually inverted from all experiential ability to understand it. But uh, yeah, so I'm also ready to be a glober since apparently we have no globers. But uh, I just wanted to give you guys a bit of update. Uh, stay tuned if you're a miswit. Check all whatever platform you've signed up for. Uh, check your messages to get access to upcoming exclusive live streams. All right, let me pop back over. Austin, would it be cool if me and you were Globers against uh, Alan and Toby? Maybe. I, I would rather just see. I would rather just get through productive <laughs> all right, all information. Right, all right. Um, me trying to figure out if what's its brain is so big because it's full of knowledge or full of gravy. It's like a nice little blend. It's a nice blend, you know. Yeah, it's knowledge gravy. <laughs> um, but thank you for the compliment, ball game. Thank you for the ten dollar tip, and uh, the implied compliment. Much much love. Let me double check. Make sure there's not a new one on here. Nope, we're good. All right, cool. So Alan, you still are there? If you got something else, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna uh, drop the screen. Yeah. All right, cool. And uh, everyone, if you have questions about this, I'm gonna I'm gonna start keeping an eye on the chat. Um, and don't be ashamed to ask questions because, like you know, I mean, you're just now learning this stuff, and you know, all the people that gaslight you about uh not believing it they don't understand it either so just just feel free to ask questions and we'll try to help you out and uh apologies in advance alan um you're so smart i think you don't realize that maybe everyone else isn't quite as smart as you but it's okay i may just uh pause you and and uh make sure everyone's good but other than that take it away bro Oh, you're good, man. I'm not smart. I just read PDFs, just familiarized with the content and everything. So, like, you know, it's not like a smart <laughs> issue. It's just a familiarity issue, really. Like, so, um, but yeah, breaking it, pausing and breaking it down will uh, definitely helps because once you get going, it's hard to hard to stop the momentum, right? But um, so we were talking about 
atomic clock velocity corrections earlier and how that's proof that the earth is stationary. It's like, well, how do, how do we, how do we come to that conclusion? Well, if there, if the other velocities existed, right? Cause remember Mickelson Morley, you can't detect motion, uh, relativity theory, all, everything's a linear geodesic, et cetera. Right now, the fact that these that these clocks account for their own velocity, well, the engineers that work on GPS started, you know, realizing like, well, wait, wait a minute, why don't we have when when these things are orbiting around the Earth and the in the in their orbits intersect with the planes of motion of the Earth going around the Sun or the Earth uh, with respect to the center of the galaxy or the galaxy moving with respect to the cosmic mi microwave background. How come none of these velocities have to get added um, and require additional corrections, right? Because there should be massive, there should be massive spikes in signal propagation or the or, and the atomic clocks themselves, right? When they're aligned with these uh, motions, and they should be added to it, right? In accordance with that, I got some clips here um, from a GPS engineer who noticed that and had some commentary on it. They proposed that maybe Earth's gravitational field holds a local ether that prevents us from detecting all these other motions, and it's just a localized effect. You know, it's kind of like viewing it through the lens of heliocentrism. You know, they have to pr propose things like this. But this is a um, like this is something that somebody noticed that works in here that understands all of this, and they were like, "Wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense." They say that we have to account for Earth rotation. Right, the satellites falling around the Earth, we have to account for Earth rotation, but we don't have to account for the orbital velocity around the Sun. What? Like this is like you know. So these are things that people have asked in the past and tried to get clarification on, proposed mechanisms for solutions for the problems, and they got nothing. So the implication is that if the satellite is only making one type of velocity correction that corresponds to a true motion and not some. Uh, abstract geodesic that can only be truly seen from a fourth perspective or uh, outside of a outside of the system, you know, traveling along the curvature of a straight line, et cetera, right? And it's just accounting for the or for the velocity as we see it, making an ellipse. So. And let's make sure that people kind of understand because they're going to immediately think, um, "What? That's not a good point, right?" And they're going to think it's the same as how you can detect rotation with like a ring laser gyro. And that in their model you can't detect the orbit it's not the same as that although it, that is also a problem right but if you like just think about being a satellite up in the sky in your model like is there an atmosphere way up there that's dragging you with the earth no right so like if you're having to account for the earth allegedly rotating why wouldn't you have to also account for it flying through space yep exactly and so like a satellite free falling around the earth would be a linear path or whatever. Well, the earth rotating or <laughs> completing a revolution around the sun would also be linear. These would have to obey Galilean velocity addition. So the, when these, like, like this guy points out, when these planes of motion intersect, you would have to, you would get variance in the speed of light proportional to those velocities um, in accordance with how it appears to be working as they fall around the earth in the first place. Right. In their, yeah, you know, in their, in their, in their interpretation, but that is yeah. epic. You're, dude, you're good for sure never going to get anything but hand wave dismissal and illusory uh, play pretend confidence that they know you're wrong or something to that. I don't even know how someone could rebut that. Has any? Have you well, seen any like written, articulated rebuttals to that? That one engineer who stepped up got shut down like immediately and was like, "I thought you guys were going to talk about balloons," and that was it. So. <laughs> Yeah, so everyone I've talked with, they're like the you know they come in with a certain energy, you know, and then when they start to understand what's going on, they're like, oh well, actually, just send me the papers and we'll and we'll talk about it. Then they disappear. And, I gotta go. Yeah. Gotta yeah. So like they, so yeah, they never come back, or or they'll say, or they'll adopt like so like for example, we use Marmont's paper a lot because he it's a really good educational piece, honestly, and um. But at the beginning of that paper, he prefaces his explanations for things and tries to make it into a mass energy re relationship, which people will say, oh, isn't that a relativistic effect? That's a whole separate thing. But, you know, no, the short answer is no. But anyway, Marmont was trying to explain the, the measured effects in this in the in those terms. Right. And they'll use that as like, oh, Marmont is promoting relativity theory and he didn't even know it. What an idiot. It's like, bro. He published over 200 papers on all kinds of stuff. He was doing some advanced research that ended up 
getting him canceled because he was questioning the fundamentals of physics and they like like him getting fired was epic dude i can pull up the it's not we don't have to get into it but yeah it, it's just it's crazy when you're like to to act like he's the one that didn't understand it or or something like that it's like he explicitly went into detail about how it didn't work and the and how they basically trial and error had to figure out how to synchronize moving clocks because Einstein's theory was completely wrong. Um, but anyway, yeah, that guy lost his career over that. Well, some other stuff, but not, um, it was in relation to questioning, you know, mainstream physics and going against relativity theory. How dare so. you? And this is what's also funny. The same people that appeal to authorities and they'll be like, they'll gaslight us, right? Like, you think you're smarter than all the scientists. Blah, blah, blah. But then we bring up the scientists, then they quickly claim that they're smarter than the scientists on their own side. And that those people are quacks and they're, you know, it's whatever. But obviously appealing to an individual in and of itself is not an intellectual way to do anything because you can have two quote unquote experts in the same field completely disagree. So which one, are they both right? Right. So obviously that's, it's about that's the a, evidence. That's a really, that's a really good point. I've, I've seen um, some disagreements from, a what would you call it like a an engineer and an astronomer right so the astronomer says gravity is not a force you know it doesn't uh you know space-time curvature isn't a force etc right and then the the engineer says well gravity has to be a force it's a force mathematically you need you, we need it to be in the subtext to that is if you're using gravity to make predictions in this that you know quote-unquote dynamic predictions in the sky you can't have it be anything other than a force otherwise you're just doing kinematics and it's all Bertenzi's. So you to even claim that what you're doing is real, it has to be an actual force. So like that's like the subtext to the importance of the conversation, but there's like, you know, high level academic nuance to it because everything is so assumed in the heliocentric model that like when they start contradicting themselves to that degree, they, they don't even realize it because they're like, well, you know, SpaceX, bro. Yeah, Space they wanna, out there somewhere. yeah, they want to have both uh, versions of gravity, which doesn't work for All right. Again, just at me in the chat if you have questions about the specific topics that we're covering because we are we are covering a lot, but um, you can go fact check all of this. And and if there's a group of people that like when you talk about this, they say, "Oh, oh, oh how do s sunsets work or stupid flirt or whatever?" Like they're irrelevant. And then if you get someone that's actually intelligent and kind of informed on the subject, they may not have heard some of this and they may be skeptical of it get them the information and then you'll see quickly their tune changes we're talking about any expert you know we're open to any expert analysis or rebuttal um we do not have to play in the mud with people that don't understand these things the true earthers are at a higher level i think that's kind of the the notion of 2024 right like if you can't rebut or respond to the argument specifically with substantive specificity like just sit it out sit this one out right so because we because we're, we're literally looking for <clears throat> legitimate rebuttal and it, it doesn't exist you can scour you know all of the ether you're not going to find it yet so just a random meta point um, I, dude, I, I think it's crazy the idea of the intersections of the planes and them not making correction for the orbital displacement is, is a trip bro yeah, it's massive. Yeah. I just like the ECI frame at all. Like, what, what does um, Bennett say? I'm made by mathematicians yeah, who they're... posing as, what does he say? <laughs> oh, yeah. I forget Physicists said, posing but... as mathematicians. It's the fantasy frame made up when it syncs it with sidereal time. It doesn't exist. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that does make a lot of sense when you say it like that. Let's explain people to us. Let's, let's explain the ECI to people. Who wants to take it? So Toby did a really good job earlier, actually, uh, because the, the whole thing is about making the speed of light and invoking a geometrically convenient position to where they can even pretend that the speed of light is the same in the first place. So, Toby, if you want to take that again, bro, that was actually, like, well said, bro. Yo, thanks, Do we have Alan. any pictures I... for people? If we don't, uh, if we don't, just go ahead. We, we, it, it's kind of hard I to show, I, I guess. Give me, give me Yo, me. we should pull up um, the... Uh... Shoot, man, why can't I think of the name of that? What's the the paper that explains Sanyak 1913? 
because we could show how they invoke that geometrically convenient position. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, bet. I got you, dog. Give me one sec. Real fast. Oh, someone I says, get... can you explain like I'm five the problems with the atomic clock? <laughs> yeah. The atomic clocks, you have to account for the velocity at which the clock itself is moving. And you shouldn't have to do that according to relativity. And worse than that, they'll gaslight you and tell you that it's proof of relativity and that you just don't know. Uh, but that's time dilation happening, which is proof of special relativity. Like literally people will assert that to you. And then Same. it's like it's it's, you know, you go looking for the substantiation of it and you find what Alan has presented, which is a bunch of, you know, explicitly the opposite of that. Doesn't even make sense on its face if you knew what time dilation was claimed to be. So, <laughs> yeah, true, true. So I remember when me and Alan were uh, digging into Ru Yang Wang's work and we were talking a lot about interferometry and this paper, actually, I believe it was provided by Grayson here on Schooling Globers. Uh, someone popped in or maybe it was just here over here on Earth Awakenings. This paper got dropped uh, and they said here or no, never mind. Never mind. This paper comes from I can science that I. Uh, he said this is a simpler way to explain Wang, and he provided this, but this is explaining 1913 Georgia Sanyak. In any case, I remember when me and Alan were reading through this, and we were like wondering what was provided as a contention to Wang. And some and he we got to, I think it was this picture here, or somewhere around here, when they first start laying this out, they started laying out their variables here. And I remember Alan saying something about like, oh, here it is. We're gonna slip into our geometrically convenient position. And like, sure enough, we scrolled. I remember like we both said that by the end of this paper, we both had like a kind of like a sick feeling in our stomach because we had been debating the interferometers, like the local Sanyak effect, which is where you rotate the interferometer. It's got nothing to do with the spin of the earth or whatever. You're just rotating the interferometer and showing that that speed of that rotation, that is a directly measurable effect. And so then we're being we were sent this paper to show us that if you just slip yourself into the very center of that rotating interferometer and you take a slice of time and then you just during that slice of time when that light's propagating during that slice of time from that position you can imagine a world in which the speed of light is constant and all of this happens so that the light the speed of light remained constant and then you can get your fringe shift still because you were you know, you viewed it from this perfectly geometrically convenient position where in which uh, time and space dilated and the math works out to show that you have that fringe shift. So basically, you're just stepping outside of reality, doing some math and then stepping back into reality. And they, they do that through this geometrically convenient position. And so that's what this is showing here. This is like they're laying out a geometrically convenient position from the center of the interferometer. And it's the center of the reference frame, essentially, um, or it's, it's it's its own. It's the center of the inertial frame. Sorry, and it's yeah, its so own. They, uh, what's that? Yeah, they, yeah, they create that inertial uh, position for it, right? An artificial position, like so, it would be stationary with respect to the fixed stars, and then they're going to watch the, you know, with from this geometrically position, geometrically convenient position, they're going to watch the rotation. They're going to watch like an observer. On the on the rim of the rotating device, experience a variance in the speed of light. <laughs> yeah, and let's give it. Let's then, get, and let's and give them pretty pictures. Let's give them pretty gonna, pictures. And they're, they're going to go from our perspective, right? The speed of light's the same, but the divergence from the rotating lad, right? This is this is because he's rotating, but because we invoke this geometrically convenient position, we can say that this is just some hypotheticalness, right? And this actually gets into the crux of the problem with the classical Sanyak effect. Because this geometrically convenient expression can't actually explain the fringe shift patterns, right? It only it can only explain a second order Doppler shift in the frequency. It wouldn't be able to explain the physical displacement of the wavelengths not being in phase, right? So that's a that's a problem in and of itself. But they preface this whole thing as if this explains anything, right? So I think I found a so, video yeah, that's wanted, got some pretty pictures. Let, so, let me. Uh, yeah, well, I wanted so I wanted to go here first to show this, and then. Now, if we pull up, uh, I'm trying to think of what paper would have a good, I think actually in the Marmay. And I have, a, I have a video that shows the ECF and the ECI, just so people yep. can like see the visualization of it. One second, um, I think yeah. I have a screenshot so, of them. The idea is basically that we're doing the exact same thing. Yep, we're taking another 
geometrically convenient position from the center of the reference frame we're invoking a, a, a center of an inertial frame that from that point in space we can take a we can take a slice of space and time or a slice of time and view the speed of light being constant from that you know that hypothetical position and that's our proof of relativity is the hypothetical position that we took that that disagrees with what was objectively measured uh in reality okay so let's show that okay so if you see the video here right they use the ECF for everything. And then to try to fit it within their model, they're gonna mathematically transform it over here to an ECI. I think that the well, they, part that's gonna help people is understand like what would the real life implications be if the ECI frame was real? Right, like, uh, like what would that mean for seasons? Yeah, so basically what you would do, right, is that would mean that um, you're taking you're essentially taking rotation out of the picture, essentially, uh, and because you're take you're saying you're centering yourself within the Earth's inertial frame, I, uh, and so you're taking you're taking the, you're essentially yeah you're you're essentially taking the center of that inertial frame, and then what that means is since the Earth wouldn't necessarily be rotating, you would just do a one giant orbit without any rotation, and so you'd have uh, like a six month day cycle and a six month night cycle. It's a it's a um. It's purely oh, hypothetical. Yeah. It's, there you go. That's you know, the part little... I want people to realize. That, like, to even try to make their math work, they have to use an Earth model where you would have a six-month-long day because they're 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 basically eliminating the rotation. So then you would just be orbiting around the sun without rotating. So you're only going to get a day based on your position as you go around the sun. That for anyone with the slightest bit of pattern recognition, you should understand quickly your claim about reality is probably not accurate. If in order to even make the math work, you have to step this far out of reality, and that's what I wanted to just kind of elucidate to people because I know that they hear us say ECF, ECI, and then we start talking about changing the reference frame of the observer to then see light that changes velocity, but actually it's not changing velocity because it's a transform, and they're just like, What are you talking about? you know, like they, they don't. They don't know what we're talking about. But anyway, um, I think, yeah, that's the exact video I was going to play too, Alan. So I think I think you guys get it. We put it pretty simple there. So, okay. I didn't mean to like completely stop the, the progression of the conversation. I just want people to like understand the base of what we're talking about. Because I think that um, we're so used to talking about it that like they're they're not always following us. Well, it's frustrating because, you know, I, I think like I've laid it out before, it, like I was saying yesterday. Um, it's difficult to explain these things because they keep ad hocing new explanations over top of things, and you can't. It's hard to even get their story straight half the time. I, uh, you know, and it's like just the fact that you rotate. Like nineteen thirteen should have been the end of it when he rotated his little interferometer. George Osaniak, and he saw that proportional velocity, they should have known at that point, oh, 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 it's definitely not the Earth moving. Like, the Earth's not moving. That's that's crazy. I mean, that just showed right there that we should be able to measure this stuff. And when they, like, they try to say that the Earth's orbit is a linear, a linear path, but it's just, you know, what is an orbit? It's a circle. It's an elliptical. And that's, it's so... So now we have to we have to invoke this magical linear geodesic that Einstein came up with to say that it's actually linear, even though it should just be like if you look at what a rotating interferometer, what is the Earth doing? It's on an axis of rotation. It's the exact same thing, but they call that linear. Well, so then they linearize the Sanyak effect. And so now they add how can well, oh, that's a closed loop, or oh, that's uh, you know, he didn't uh properly account for refraction or something, which is just crazy because he should he, he properly did the math to show that refraction had nothing to do with it um but in any case it just gets it's it sucks that we have to we have to break like all these uh we have to get so complicated with it and it seems like like i just i hate how we have to explain so much to people it's hard to know where to meet people at because a lot of people have been indoctrinated with some, with a lot of these things already they're they're really they, so a lot of people are you know maybe not a high level with a lot of these things but they have a you know somewhat of a background they know you know what should be said or shouldn't be said about the speed of light or whatever so we kind of have like it's hard to know how much has to be unwound 
to even address these things and explain these things to people, I guess. Yeah, but for sure, the average person has no idea what ECI is, right? Um, no, yeah, well, definitely not. Let's go with something simple then. You remember that orbital velocity that you guys know you have, but you never measured, and we kept disagreeing on Mickelson and Morley? Well, you know what they don't account for ever in any of these multiple moving body systems that they definitely should is, yeah, that orbital velocity again, not accounted for. It doesn't matter. Whipping around 56,000, no sweat. You know what I mean? Yeah, and of course, let's take it to the real simple understanding of it too, because I think this is such an important part of it. I think they've, I've done the same mistake where I'm like, they changed velocity relative to center of the ECI, and people are like, what are you talking about? Um, again, ECEF means Earth centered, Earth fixed, and then you have the Earth centered inertial frame, right? And inertial just means not changing or not accelerating. So if if they if the axis is earth centered so you go to the center of the this assumed globe here and you start your coordinate system there and then you make it inertial you're nullifying the rotation of the earth which is why you see the coordinate system not moving with the rotation of the earth when it's on the earth centered inertial one here That's what you have to do to try to make the math work for the data of GPS just really soak that in for a second. Who has a who has a viable explanation of reality again? The model that's that has to mathematically create six month long days. So so math doesn't answer physics problems. So I'm ho hope like I think this this in and of itself shows the whole problem. The fact that this even has to be created at all mathematically shows there is a glaring problem here, right? Is that just me? Like I I think I think people with pattern recognition will see that, but all right anyway. I think they definitely get it now. I mean um and they're and they're and they're accounting for change in velocity, they're accounting for anisotropic uh signal propagation and all these things. Do we have another um specific topic you guys want to cover about any of this? I guess this is where we, you do have to kind of get into the weeds and to lay the foundation, huh? What's that, Val? No, I think we did a really good job of going over, like, the complexities and meta of it and then, you know, breaking down the intricacies, man, cause, and provided some good visuals to, to accompany that. Because, like, like we were talking about earlier, it's not, like, understanding this isn't, like, you're not going to get it on the first time. That's crazy, dog. Like, you, you know, this requires a ton of, you know, interest in reading and, uh, like, up, you know, applying it, right? Which which we can all do. Um, so definitely, you know, don't feel bad if you don't get it or whatever, but like they do this stuff right in our faces. And then they tell us all that relativity is true and space time and all this stuff. And it's like literally the technology outpaced relativity, uh, you know, so quick, so quickly, it's just insane. And they've, they've just been lying ever since it's all a facade. Like people that actually work in that stuff and, and made it, it has nothing to do with relativity. They specific like that 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 six month day coordinate system that they need to hide the variance and see is you know just things that they had to do to keep the lie going, keep the deception going. Exactly. What did you guys think about the um, the orbital mechanics part? Because like they don't even get that. They they don't get the orbital mechanics, right? Like just like my boy right here said. Or we can pop it up like this for you guys. But again, once more for the record, it's been shown at least six different ways this century alone that the equations in physics used by NASA to launch satellites are identical to the equations derived from a geocentric universe. Important to note, directly contradictory to the, to the belief that the Earth is in a heliocentric model. Thus, if the space program is proof of anything... It proves geocentricity and disproves heliocentrism. The evidence for heliocentrism is even weaker than the evidence for evolution. PhD astronomer Gerard Bow. It is important to understand why he's saying that. That isn't something that you can dispute. That isn't something that goes away if you call him a quack. That isn't something that that goes away if you say that we're quote mining him. I mean, how could you even claim that that was cherry picked or quote mined, right? Could it be more like point blank? What surrounding context is going to make that mean the opposite of what he said? You know what I'm saying? I don't think people know what know what cherry picking means, but um so yeah, I'm just curious if you guys think I'm overlooking anything. I mean, I've kind of made this argument up for the most part myself. So, you know, I'm 
I'm certainly open to critique, but I don't really see how I'm wrong here. I mean, it hasn't hit hard yet. Like, it's never been uh, refuted, countered. Like, the, the guy who was the best able to refute it sat down immediately, and Alan only did, like, two minutes. So, I mean, once you understand it, I don't think there's any way around it. No, I mean, like, even the meta here with, like, the, okay, like the, the Maki and Principle within their own paradigm, you're going to have... And by the way, this isn't just a quote from Wikipedia. I just showed, like, physics textbooks explaining this. And so you're going to have... Uh, it's seen that the Coriolis acceleration, that's where they got this quote, of course, not only cancels the centripetal acceleration, but together they provide a net centripetal radially inward component of acceleration that is direct, directed toward the center of rotation. And so where I heard a partial, par partial bit of this idea was back in the day, Roberts and Genesis. And I remember that this screenshot, you see the date here, once he put, put, put it out on a video, they took it off Wikipedia why would they do that it's still in physics textbooks it's still just a fact of physics right so anyway um and the point that i'm making here is so like i, I veer off a bit from syngenis right like it isn't just equally valid it is only valid one way <laughs> so that's kind of the point i'm making here so i i'm I'm open to someone telling me how i'm wrong but i think this explains it right here right let's just cover this and see if you guys what you guys think I think this is such a death blow. Um, at the time of Mickelson Morley, they assumed Newtonian mechanics, right? We've covered that. We covered that a few episodes ago. I'll, I'll title all the episodes so you'll know where to go back and look. And so at the time, they believed that uh, there was an ether. They believed that space was absolute and fixed. They believed that the Earth was moving through space that was absolute and fixed, tilted, wobbling, spinning, revolving around the sun, right? And so then they went to test it, and they thought for sure that they're going to find basically the effect of a drift or a drag specifically a drag um with the earth moving through this ether that was fixed and they didn't yo are, are, are you screen sharing right now um am i not sharing for you guys yeah, oh I'm not, I'm not i'm not i'm not i'm huh? not i am but not the right one. Oh, good call good call are right, you guys can see the powerpoint now right uh, yep yeah so if you it's important to wrap our minds around this right so according to newton this is what everyone believed and when people say you can still use newtonian mechanics this is what they're claiming okay and the fact that you can derive it with uh with newtonian mechanics or einsteinian mechanics doesn't matter because they make opposite claims okay so we're talking about which one's viable in terms of physics and mechanics specifically this is orbital mechanics and so you would have the earth continuing in a straight path unless an outside force acts upon it, right? The law of inertia. So here you have inertia, the Earth's mass seeks to move in a straight line at the velocity of the momentum so that P equals M times V, right? So momentum equals mass times velocity. It's gonna continue in a straight path unless an outside force acts upon it. Let me go full screen for everybody too. Um, boom, boom, boom. Okay. So this is what was believed at the time. I don't know if the YouTube can see my mouse, but hopefully. Okay, so there means there's an outside force. What do they think that was? Gravity. Gravity was the outside force. It was basically pulling the Earth around the sun. So it was pulling it from its straight, fat, its straight path around the sun. Well, Mickelson Morley did not detect the Earth's movement. What did they do? Einstein came in and said, oh, well, it's because the Earth is actually not in a curved path when you're on the Earth. It's free-falling on a straight path. It's a linear path. It free-falls. It's just like the bidding warping of space-time. And actually, gravity isn't technically a force. It may deceive you into thinking it's a force in certain reference frames, but it's actually technically not a force. And gravity is the effect of the bending and warping of space-time. The Earth is just free-falling in a linear path, a straight line through space-time that's bending and warping. So from an outside reference frame it would look like the earth is curving say in relation to the sun but on the earth it's going straight your interferometer can't detect it because you're on the earth and it's just free falling in a straight path and that there's no force acting upon it so we've covered this ad nauseum at this point on this channel but this is where heliocentrism and newtonian mechanics take two different paths they can no longer coincide now the reason this is important is now you invoke GPS satellites. If you invoke a satellite, well, what do they do? They, they send them up and they use an ECEF, which we just showed right here. Um, and you guys won't be able to see this, so it doesn't matter. I'm just gonna show real quick. 
So Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinate system, this is what they use. And what would the heliocentric model actually be? Now, technically, their model is no longer heliocentric. And uh, like we said, when you get into where Newton thought that the sun was the center of the entire universe. But they would use a, a solar baryonic-centered uh, coordinate system. That's what would accurately be their model, right? The solar baryonic center. Okay, now they don't use that, and it's because the math is way more complicated. But you could use that math and you'd get the same result as the ECF, mathematically. But they're obviously, if, if you're talking about reality, they're obviously distinctly different, right? One is the Earth's not moving, it's in the center. One is the Earth is moving many different vectors and it's going around like uh, the, the sun, effectively. But not quite the center of the sun, right? So they're different claims in reality. They use the ECEF. You can get, this is, I'm trying to really get this concept through to people. You can use both of those coordinate systems and get the same mathematical solution. One is claiming that the earth is moving around the sun. One's claiming that the earth is not moving. You get the same dynamic result, mathematical solution, but they are distinctly different physical claims. So if you get the same solution, can they both be true in reality just because they both get you the same mathematical solution? The answer is obviously no. So when people say, oh, they're the same, he didn't replace him, you can get the same, that is all just wrong. Okay, but not to veer off too much, my point is that they use the ECF because the math is simpler, but this is the problem. It has physical implications. Your, if you use Newtonian mechanics and an earth center earth fixed coordinate system, you can't do that anymore. That's, you can't do that. In fact, if heliocentrism was true, it wouldn't work if you tried to do it that way. And the reason for that is because relativity says that there, there are not real inertial forces at play. But if you are accounting for angular momentum of the universe moving around the earth-centered, earth-fixed central point, and then you're going to get centrifugal forces and then centripetal forces as a Rayleigh inward accelerative force towards the center of that system, right? If you actually put a satellite up there and it starts working just like that, then you have a major problem. And if you're, if you're accounting for the, the act, satellite actually curving, well, well, why? I thought it was free falling in a linear path around the earth. And this is where they'll say, they'll go back to, well, you can do the math, but no, it's not about math. It's about physics. It's about physics. So I, I don't know. I'm hoping that I'm making sense here. So long story short, if you if, if these satellites are proof of anything, right? It would be that the earth's not moving and there's an actual angular momentum that has a net inward force, right? Based on the, the cosmos moving around the earth. The fact that it works is evidence towards geocentricity directly in contradiction to heliocentrism. Uh, and even worse than that, even if you can show, you can show a dynamic equivalence between geocentrism and heliocentrism with Newtonian mechanics, your model can't even use Newtonian mechanics anymore. And that's where we get into my boy, my boy Assis talking about the relational mechanics and how relativity, dun, 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 does not even yield the measured values of these quantities in the Earth's frame of reference. This analysis shows clearly that in general relativity, kinematically equivalent situations, so like the Earth is stationary and the sun moves around it, or the sun is stationary and the Earth moves around it, are equally valid. They're just different coordinate systems, right? That direct quote from Einstein, that's a kinematic equivalence. He says this analysis shows clearly that in GR, kinematically equivalent situations are not dynamically equivalent. That is a major, major problem if you're using the dynamics of Newtonian mechanics to allegedly put these satellites up and it's working. You cannot claim that what's actually happening in, re in reality is relativistic because there isn't a dynamic equivalence. So now you have a serious problem. Because if it's actually working, it can't be working if relativity's true. Well, if relativity is not true, it can't be the Earth orbiting around the sun. Heliocentrism can't be true. So you have a domino effect coming all the way from the satellites. Now, do I expect like zealous people to ever accept this truth? No. To give up the, the talking point about satellites? Of course not, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And then here I go to show, well, actually I can replace your model with like significant 
amounts of viability superior to yours. It's not even close. And we could use a magnetic field generated by the rotation of, of distant galaxies. And I don't believe in your distances. So you, all you need is for something to have started it. Well, everyone needs that, right? How are you going to have any of this without something starting it? All you need is it to start moving around. Well, why the earth? <laughs> well, if the earth's in the center, then you know someone put it there. Go ask them. None of that matters. None of that matters. So anyway, hopefully this makes sense. I am going all over the place. And then this is where he explains um, the alleged flattened figure of the earth or Foucault's pendulum can no longer be utilized as proofs of the earth's uh, real rotation. And we also, of course, I don't know if it's in this one, but we have Einstein, of course, conceding to that as well. And then actually while we're here, I want to read this. Okay. So I'll read this and then I'm going to open it back up. But I know this is information heavy, but I know some people may find it edifying. Hopefully you guys are following me because it's a it's a death blow to them. Like GPS satellites is the last thing they should ever bring up. And I'm just talking about the orbital mechanics. And then Alan and Toby and Shane want to run over here and just start slicing up whatever left of it you thought you had. And the signals themselves refute it. So, however, it seems to be rather difficult beforehand to acknowledge the accelerated systems of reference as equivalent to the systems of inertia as regards the description of natural phenomena. When in, uh, when in the following chapters we speak of an accelerated system, simply we always have in mind a system accelerated relative to the systems of inertia or to the fixed stars. For example, if we consider a purely mechanical system consisting of a number of material particles acted upon by given forces and with velocities small compared with the velocity of light relative to a system of inertia, Newton's fundamental equations of mechanics may be applied with good approximation in the description of the system. On the other hand, if we wish to describe the system in an accelerated system of reference, we must introduce, as is well known, so-called fictitious forces, centrifugal forces, Coriolis forces, etc., which have no connection whatever with the physical properties of the mechanical system itself. In fact, they depend exclusively on the acceleration of the system of reference introduced relative to the systems of inertia. It was just for this reason that Newton introduced the concept of absolute space. Which, would, which should represent the system of reference where the laws of nature assume the simplest and most natural form. However, as mentioned at the beginning of chapter two, the notion of absolute space lost its physical meaning as soon as the special principle of relativity was generally accepted. So that probably means you can't claim that it didn't replace it, huh? Which has no clue what he's reading. You're coping, you're coping. Uh, let's just read it again. So what do what do the uh, the well, anti flat earthers? Let's just call them what they are. What do they say? Stupid flurf. Einstein didn't replace Newton. It's the same thing. He just went a step further. And you can use Einstein's to get back to Newton's equations. You are incorrect. They it absolutely did replace and supersede Newton. And we're going to read it again, right? It was just for this reason that Newton introduced the concept of absolute space, which should represent the system of reference where the laws of nature assume the simplest and most natural form. Uh-oh, can't have that. However, as mentioned at the beginning of chapter two, the notion of absolute space lost its physical meaning as soon as the special principle of relativity was generally accepted. For as a consequence of this principle, it became impossible by any experiment to decide which system of inertia had to be regarded as the absolute system. But we're always gonna treat it like it's the stationary lab frame, huh? Therefore, Einstein advocated a new interpretation of the fictitious forces in accelerated systems of reference instead of regarding them as an expression of a difference in principle between the fundamental equations and uniformly moving and accelerated systems, he considered both kinds of systems of reference to be completely equivalent as regards the form of the fundamental equations and the fictitious forces were treated as real forces on the same footing as any other force of nature. The reason for the occurrence and accelerated systems of reference of such peculiar forces should, according to this new idea, 
be sought in the circumstance that the distant masses of the fixed stars are accelerated relative to these systems of reference. The fictitious forces are thus treated as a kind of gravitational force, the acceleration of the distant masses causing a field of gravitation in the system of reference considered. Therefore, what it's explaining is once you removed absolute space through Newtonian mechanics, and then you come back in with Einstein, and he changes the debt. He says you can attach no true physical meaning to anything considered absolute. There is no such thing as absolute reference strength. The only thing absolute in the entire universe is speed of light. And that's your absolute, although not a reference frame, you measure everything against it because to measure anything, you have to have something absolute to measure against. Well, he chose light. Every other uh, reference frame cannot have no true absolute uh, nature, right? You, you can't attribute physical meaning to any claim of uh, a reference frame being absolute. It's just light is absolute, okay? So this has physical implications, and one of them being that these real inertial forces or these fictitious forces now have to be treated as real forces. And what does that mean? It means that actual distant uh, masses would impact the Earth, and then that would, ha that would cause you to actually end up... Uh, allowing something to go faster than the speed of light within relativity but anyway anyway the the point here is that the the very beginning of this page is really the important part right it is that when you introduce special relativity the notion of absolute space has been completely replaced so in terms of actual physics right the mechanical claims of the two ideas einstein and newtonian they are directly contradictory they cannot be simultaneously true that's a violation of the law of non-contradiction and if you bring up the math that's just a red herring fallacy it's just irrelevant it's a non sequitur it means nothing okay so hopefully i know that was a lot of reading but and this is where again he kind of explains that um Contrary to what most people seem to believe about relativity, actually, you can have something go faster than the speed of light without violating the theory of relativity, right? And that would be specifically in the sense of uh, a stationary Earth with uh, extremely large gravitational fields and uh, strong forces generated by the angular momentum of distant galaxies and stars, for example. Then in the presence of those strong gravitational fields, something could, including matter, go faster than the speed of light without violating relativity, and that's just showing that there is an application that can give you um, a dynamic validity to a geocentric uh, model, even with relativity. Okay, so I know this is a lot, but my, my main point here is as it ties in and to tie it all in together is that, oh, let me cover this one more time. I'm basically just doing my PowerPoint again. I'm sorry, but so like this is, this is the last proposition of Newton and he explains that in order for the earth to be at rest, um, that you could have gravity and basically an equal and opposite reaction. And if you had that, then the earth could in fact be in the center and everything moving around it, like in the Tychonic system. But this is when he thought the sun was in the center of the entire universe, which means Newton wrote his entire Principia. The final thing that he wrote was with all that being said, the earth actually could be in the center, just like the Tychonic system. If you had an equal and opposite reaction, you had an additional force akin to gravitation. And that was with the assumption that the sun is in the center of the entire universe, right? But if you remove that assumption, which your model now does that, of course, <laughs> right? Your model does not claim the sun's the center of the entire universe. In fact, it claims that the sun is a very small star in relation to the rest of the universe, and that there are crazy masses and crazy gravitational fields and distances and stuff, that if all that was factored in, then you would, uh, you would have a completely valid geocentric position, even with the Newtonian mechanics. And the only reason it seems like I'm like off topic and I'm talking about history and what did Newton say and what did he think? Well, they used Newtonian mechanics in these in with these satellites and it has very real implications when you start to find out that they are not the same when you try to draw out a dynamic equivalence they are distinctly different and einstein had to treat them as if they are completely uh fictitious but we'll just treat them like they're real anyway and he redefined how that could even be possible and that's that's all that you can grasp onto but what i'm saying is in reality if we put a satellite up in closing i'll actually close it here like if you're putting a satellite up and you're accounting for the earth to be stationary a change of velocity uh a change in direction and real inertial forces of centrifugal and coriolis forces 
and Euler forces, and the Coriolis forces are a net inward force, then when you put the satellite up there and it works, what you've just proven is like positive physical evidence for the Earth being stationary and some type of angular momentum being generated in reality around the Earth. Because you're not even using your framework. You're using a different framework. And your framework specifically has none of that. It doesn't have the real inertial forces and it also doesn't have um, any curved path. So anyway, there you go. And that's when it actually crosses over into what Alan's talking about. Well, then why are you not accounting, if you're accounting for the alleged rotation, why are you not accounting for the orbit? Right? So it's like, I don't know if I'm saying all this concisely and coherently enough for people to follow, but it's very simple. And this guy says it really well. It's like, based on the actual physics and equations, if you understand the difference in Einstein and Newton and you understand the difference um, between them dynamically and how, uh, like the difference between say a geocentric position or a heliocentric position, the fact that they're successfully implementing alleged, let's just say satellites allegedly using the Newtonian mechanics around ECEF uh, would not be possible if relativity were actually true. And unfortunately for you guys, you cannot use Newtonian mechanics anymore. It was falsified in your paradigm in 1887. And there's no way around it. Why do you guys, why do you guys think that they don't still say maybe Newton's right? Because he can't be. And again, I'll read this one more time. I know I keep saying it, but I, I can tell that I'm losing people. But like, this is the important part. One of the main reasons, and this is only one of many, right? That you cannot claim that they're the same. You can no longer use Newton. It's not permissible within your, your notion of reality anymore. Is the notion of absolute space lost its physical meaning as soon as the special principle of relativity was generally accepted for as a consequence of this principle it became impossible by any experiment to decide which system of inertia had to be regarded as the absolute system so it's it's over you don't have absolute space anymore so you have to have relativity to claim that the earth is orbiting but then you turn around and have to use newtonian mechanics the assumption of real inertial forces earth center earth fixed change in direction change in velocity all relative to the center of that coordinate system none of which can exist in your paradigm all right all right whatever i love how you pointed out that the equivalence between the newtonian framework and the relativistic framework. Like I love how you pointed that out as part of the GPS conversation. And it's funny because it's funny how they act like the equivalence of a predictive value on the small scale of Newtonian, of the Newtonian framework is like irrelevant to the conversation. Like they say, they, they claim they can just hold on to Newtonian mechanics and that the fact that there's supposed to be a relativistic equivalence in their, uh, in their paradigm they act like that's okay to have both of those, but then as soon as you bring up a geocentric equivalence, they'll like freak out and say, "Oh no, that's that can't be real." Blah blah blah. Like they they will they'll push back against that, but then you really start digging into the GPS stuff, and it makes it even worse because then you know it turns out that kind of the geocentric evidence turns out to be the only viable option, uh, unless you want to accept the religious ideal that all the imaginary reference frames are equally as valid to you as reality is. Yeah, and let me, uh, someone said, can you explain absolute space like I'm five? Yeah, it's just, it's absolute, it's fixed. It's it's like something that you can measure against reliably because it's unchanging, absolute unchanging. Um, what is so interesting is like, this is this is the main reason that I, I'm harping on this so hard is what do they say? They say, how could it stay up there? I'm like, bro, how could it stay up there on a flat earth or whatever, right? It's like the very physics that is invoked within the equations to use the satellites tells you the answer to that question. And if you claim that it isn't possible, that means you do not even understand what they're claiming to do with the satellites and the physics that they're invoking to use them. They invoke real forces that are generated with angular momentum of the universe moving around a stationary earth, which would keep the satellites in perpetual motion in relation to the center of that angular momentum. 
So you cannot say, well, how would they stay up there? The very physics and equations tells you the answer. So you can't even invoke them without conceding on that point. So then what do they have? What do they have, right? Like they're, they're going to claim that, like the, the, obviously they should be able to understand you can do a coordinate system transform, right? So like they have nothing. There's no reason for us to be afraid of GPS satellites. They're like their worst nightmare. Especially when you get into the fact that the atomic clocks have to actually account for the velocity at which they move. There should be no proportional relationship between atomic clocks, right? They have to account for first order velocity corrections based on how fast the satellite is moving and what direction it's going. Why would they have to do that? So I think this is one of the biggest parts of the lie, right? Is like, they have automatic corrections embedded into the GPS system. They have meridian corrections. They have uh, Sagnac effect corrections that aren't supposed to be there. They run it through mathematics so detached from reality, it could never actually be a viable explanation. But people don't know any of that. They just see like, oh, it works within relativity. Look, here's the math. So I don't, I don't like, I think that true earthers should definitely familiarize yourself with some of this stuff and definitely not be scared of you be like look i mean i know there's a bunch of balloons that they clearly didn't really want us knowing about and like they can go really high they can stay up there for over two months they can send signals and triangulate do all kinds of things a lot of signals are sent from the ground as well but even if there are satellites up there that doesn't falsify flat earth how's it impossible on a flat earth and they'll say how's it staying up there and then you <laughs> You could just say, well, the actual physics and equations that the satellites use account for an angular momentum of the universe spinning around a stationary Earth. So I guess if we were going to trust the physics and equations that they use, it, it would be the universe is keeping it up there with angular momentum. There's nothing to be afraid of at all, because once you look under the hood, like it is with everything they claim proves relativity, it actually refutes relativity. Because then you find out there's anisotropic signal propagation that you have to account for proportional velocity, even with like atomic clocks, with all of the signals. It's like, oh, oh, this doesn't, this doesn't prove relativity. It literally proves it's not true, right? So, all right, rant over. Perfectly said. Don't be afraid, right? Absolutely not, because they don't know anything about GPS when they bring it up to hurt you with it. So know a little bit more and you'll be fine. Or you can know a lot more. All of it's good and hurts them, right? Uh, Eugene Austin, who can take who can take a saddle and tell you that it falls <laughs> around exactly what they lack to tell the truth? Balls, the NASA man can. That's funny. <laughs> I, I should almost play this song. Thank you for the ten dollar uh, tip, Gene Austin. Has everyone Girl, in here seen that song? Can was fire. Dude, yeah, so shout out to Jaren. That was epic. So yeah, it was good. awesome. And CMG. Oh yeah, shout out to him too. Dude, it's like insane how much, how many different uh, styles that dude can do. I didn't even know he was. He participated in it, man. That's awesome. That yeah, dude is yeah. so talented. He is, dude. It's insane how good it is. So Jaron wrote it, then he performed it. I may play that before I uh, log off. Um, I was going to do a rendition of Stan for some purposes <laughs> that will be used later. <laughs> that's all right, dude. That's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously we have the one person here that's asking to be unmuted, but I don't, I don't see that being fruitful. Right. Oh, hell no. Not anymore. <laughs> no, they said they were going to ask why you weren't speaking at a university. Oh, I don't care. Oh, wow. Wow, what a great input. Hey, when I publish a paper, you're going to read it and then follow me around and ask dumb questions about it. I think there should be like prerequisites for certain people, right? That they have to answer like even in the chat. So it's like, uh, <laughs> like, uh, did Einstein supersede and replace Newton? Does it make uh, contradictory claims? Was Newtonian mechanics debunked within heliocentrism? Like, if they don't answer those correctly, then it's like, all right, get out of here. Because then you know you just guarantee they'll never come on here that way. Intellectually dishonest for sure, and probably deceitful by intent, right? Absolutely, that shows that exactly. Yeah, 
Yeah, like it's it's so simple. Like the primary ones, right? Of course, is uh, Newton said space was absolute and fixed. Einstein specifically did away with that, and then Newton said gravity was a force. In fact, a, a force inherent to mass, and he couldn't understand how. And uh, Einstein said gravity is not a force. It just kind of looks like a force, but it's just the effect of bending warping in space time. It's not a force. So one said force, one said not a force. One said space is absolute, one said space is not absolute. Those are contradictory claims, right? Um, one said the object will continue in a straight path unless an outside force acts upon it. Einstein said no, an object can go straight and curved at the same time based on different reference frame and it doesn't require a force. Newton said that uh, there is no time variable, gravity is instant, requires a medium in between to facilitate the, the interaction um, due to mutual contact, i.e. an ether. And Einstein specifically said that there is no required medium, there is no ether. Those are four huge fundamental components of their theories that are directly opposite to one another. Well, where did everyone go with relativity? Why? Because you could not use the other one to explain Michelson Morley. Try to explain that the Earth orbits the sun with, with Michelson Morley results with an ether and an actual curved path with an actual force pulling the Earth around it through an ether. Good luck. You can't, obviously, right? That's why it flipped physics upside down. So anyway yep and the, an important distinction on that note to end on is that they knew that there would be a proportional velocity relationship in the measurement with light so like that's why they flipped all of physics over this it wasn't like this was like a proposition and then oh it didn't work out it doesn't mean anything like no this is like the turning point in physics because they without an explanation to this the implication is that one the earth is stationary with respect to an ether wind right because there was a measurement made right now they say oh now in the paper they don't even say instrumental error or anything like that people say that after the fact and they actually tried to t <clears throat> they actually explain what was measured right they take that that measurement that uh, what was it four to six or was it yeah four to six kilometers a second <clears throat> and they say well actually that was due to link contraction and the direction of motion so you can't say oh nothing was measured you can't say no result you can't say statistical error or anything like that if the thing that was measured is then turned around to be proof of the of, of a of a uh of a contraction mechanism to prove the validity of a theory being put forward to explain why the full amount wasn't measured right that would be insane to claim that so if you read the paper they actually don't say anything about that and they say well we measured a velocity that was much slower than what we thought and they don't really make any comments on that and they suggest that that future experiments should be repeated at later uh you know throughout the season right so that they could get very so that they could measure uh, to, to see if they were even measuring the effect that they thought they were they wanted to do it seasonally right because at the equinoxes you're going to have a variance if the if the earth is you know moving a, uh, in an ellipse or whatever right so to complete that motion you're going to have the slowing down and speeding up so they suggested that they do that and then they ended up not even doing it that's where miller popped in but yeah Yeah, that's such a good point. That's such an important point. It was just like the reason they knew they had to react to it is because they already had established empirically the proportional velocity relationship. If they had not done that, that wasn't a problem. They could have just ignored it. They would just hand we've dismissed it. That's why it's so funny that like globe earthers run around now pretending that's what you can do. You know what I'm saying? Now in 2024, like these anti feathers run around and act like, oh, you can just, all you have to do is get rid of an ether anyway. Like you just dismiss it. That's all I did. Like, no, 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 no. But anyway, um, if you see here, obviously I just pulled it up real quick. The discovery of the aberration of light was soon followed by the explanation according to the emission theory. The effect was attributed to a simple composition of the velocity of light with the velocity of the Earth in its orbit. The effect was attributed to a simple composition of the velocity of light with the velocity of the Earth in its orbit maybe a third time for the people in the back the effect was attributed to a simple composition of the velocity of light with the velocity of earth in its orbits okay i'm glad we got that covered and nothing to do with the motion of the earth so yeah anyway obviously you can obviously go through there and just look at the actual equation and know what the equation actually means and has the velocity of the I mean, earth that must be 
that must be why Albert Einstein in 1905 said that that was part of why he was writing the paper was the <laughs> failure to detect the motion of the earth through a, a medium. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. And they'll say it's cherry picked, but, but how many times have we pulled the paper up and gone through the entire thing in context to prove that it's not quote mind or cherry picked and they just still say it anyway? Like, it's like, okay, well you just, what's it just quoting Einstein here? This isn't Einstein. This is Mickelson Morley's paper, bro. Spread the love, brother. Well, all right. I uh, I think it's pretty interesting, man. And we can. Uh, I'm gonna check the uh, for any do- any more donations, you guys. But I think it's a pretty simple um, summary here, right? Like, there's no reason to be scared of GPS satellites. Like, obviously, if you're making a claim that some object is free falling and changing direction perpetually in a vacuum, like, yeah, you have the burden of proof. And if I challenge that or don't believe it or deny it, like you don't get to shift the burden onto me and say, disprove it, prove it's not real, prove it's not doing that, explain how else it could happen. Like, no, no. Like, can you show me a demonstration of an object free falling and changing direction perpetually? Of course you can't. That's a completely made up fairy tale version of physics that doesn't exist. It will never exist. It can't exist. And the only reason it theoretically exists is because it's needed to explain away the evidence that refuted that the earth, the claim the earth is moving. That's a fact. We're supposed to grant them like just unlimited room to make anomalous claims of physics. Oh, this is just the anomalous physics. When it comes to the earth being a ball orbiting the sun, physics becomes anomalous. A lot of anomalies in the heliocentric model. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's anomalous physics. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, and then of course, even beyond that, it's like, well, let's say that they are up there. It's it's a big problem for you. It's actually a big problem for you, right? Um, One thing I like to ask: it's like when they try to make that argument that the Mickelson Morley had nothing to do with the motion with. Uh, with the motion of the earth. I mean, like that's, I I don't think anyone, uh, that's not even really an an argument worth humoring, but when they try to say it had nothing to do with why Albert Einstein derived special relativity, one thing I like to ask, aside from just like literally going to the 1905 paper and showing that's literally the only thing he says, but it's like, okay, then what caused Albert Einstein to derive special relativity? What did he use to do that? And, it, you know, I, th- I think that's a pretty crucial question, right? Like, why then, if it had nothing to do with Mickelson Morley, what was it? Why did we flip all of physics on its head? You know, just a, a common logical line of logic you could try and take to try and figure this out for yourself. But, yeah. The answer is the fact that they couldn't measure the ocean, the motion of the Earth. So they just started, they had to just come up with a new measuring stick to, to something to warp reality around. And they used, they decided to make their constant the speed of light. <laughs> Dude, I forget that we ask that all the time. Like, what is their answer to that? All of a sudden there was Mickelson Morley and like, just like the Big Bang, once there was nothing, then there was everything. All of a sudden it was here. <laughs> everything's cool. Like what, what happened? Dude, yeah, I've never, I've never, ever had anyone actually per- try and answer that question, like in an honest fashion. Well, it wasn't for what you said it was. I know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't understand it, but I know you're wrong about it. Glober should understand all of this. Math and observations are dependent upon the location of the observer at the time of the observation, right? It's not as simple as just spouting out formulas and claiming absolution. RG, the artist, thank you for $10 donation. That is an interesting point, actually, a parallel where uh, it's supposedly always relative to the observer, right? Except for when it comes to the sky. And we point out that the stuff we see in the sky is in a parent position. Oh, that's crazy. So you can claim it for all of physics that uses a stationary lab frame, real physical reality that isn't merely optical. But when we call, we invoke it for what it obviously would be, which is something that is optical, will be in a parent location intrinsically. It's insane to think that what we observe is relative to the observer's position. But when it comes to actual physics, 
you can do mental gymnastics and just drown and bathe in math and magic and then somehow that is a viable explanation <laughs> i mean it feels good i bet yeah it's funny thank you for the donation so yeah uh i won't make it go much longer i thought i'll pull up a bunch more papers but it's like i mean how many times have we pulled up mickelson morley and they're still gonna say it Mickelson Morley just disproved the ether. Mickelson Morley was just trying to detect the ether. Mickel- like, you know, I guess at some point you have to just accept, like, they're just going to do it regardless. Well, this time I'm just going to drop a little Dropbox full of ether cosmology share file with all the GPS papers. Should anyone, like, go with me? Well, I love to ask the question, like, oh, okay, well then, uh, what was the equation they used to get their friendships? Like, what did they use to get their friendship prediction if it didn't have anything to do with the orbit of the Earth? The motion of the static, stupid luminiferous ether. <laughs> yeah, oh, like, it's so funny. Like, <laughs> you know what's not yeah. even in the equation? <laughs> that stuff was whipping around there, around, all, around everything 66 miles an hour. We're just sitting here. <laughs> That's good. You know what's funny, right? Is they were all into a stationary ether. But then, so dating back to Aries' success, right? They say, okay, we're going to use a stationary ether framework. And if when we fill the telescope with water, we have to correct it by 30 arc seconds. So I'm just, I'm no math wizard, right? But I'm going to go ahead and assume that one arc second would be equivalent to one kilometer per second, meeting 30 kilometers a second for Earth's orbital velocity, right? So, they, so that was their prediction, right? Like, so they had to, what? I'm just going to question that motivation when you're done explaining it. <laughs> Okay, so that was their uh, prediction, right? That they had to correct the telescope by 30 arc seconds to keep starlight centered in it when they added water. And they had to correct it by about 8 arc seconds, right? So that's a. So you know what they said to explain that? They were like, okay, well, you know how we had this stationary ether prediction? Maybe, maybe the ether outside of the telescope is actually the static ether. And inside of the telescope, the ether is mobile and it's bouncing around. And that bouncing is carrying the starlight in the opposite direction of motion. And everyone was like, oh, no way. Aries success. <laughs> or I mean, Aries failure. Let's never talk about it again and right, uh, move right, on. Aries, right? Like, so <laughs> so they, they, did, they did this. So at the uh, end of the Nicholson-Morley paper, they kind of suggest the same thing when they bring up Stokes and Fresnel and Lorenz's theory. And he bangs out those and says that those don't work. You know, those wouldn't work either, right? So it's like whenever you know the, the, they would adopt the stationary framework, and then they're like, when they don't get the result, they're like, maybe it's bouncing around, creating that persistent illusion that we can't measure it. Like, all right, dude, see you laser with that one. Do you really think they would? They believed in the stationary ether, or they just kind of pushed it to make the real ether look, you know, like this and never found it stupid? I think you know originally they probably did right, and then. That's- Aries was the you know chief royal of the Royal Society of that astronomy. So I mean, like he was in you know king of the club. Yeah. What like, do you think about? It sounds really stupid, and then what they're doing now is pretty much saying like, well, no, no, everything that you wanted was just that stationary ether that we made look stupid. So you know, I don't know what you're looking at. And it's yeah. always that, and they always disprove it. Like every experiment, they're like, oh, you know what it was though? That stationary ether definitely wasn't the real ether. All right, see so, ya. Yeah. Yeah, anything to avoid proposing the mechanism that the ether would be in motion because that would immediately call into question any velocity components measured. The thing they've been purporting on for like 60 years by this time when they keep lying about it. I think the funniest part of all of it is Einstein just basically didn't even give an answer to really anything though. Right, like he was just like, if we don't answer like 10 questions, I can, I think I can make it work mathematically. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's exactly it, man. He's like, what, the Earth, Earth didn't move? Hold on, hold my beer. Whole world yeah. moved around the Earth. How do you like that? All right, I'm done. <laughs> like, oh, light, light, it just does its thing, bro. Don't worry about it. So, so you know how they got the, they got, they essentially got a small fringe pattern for Aries failure, right? If you want to look at it like that, because they had to correct it by eight arc seconds, right? So you could look at it like a small fringe. 
And then in Mickelson Morley, they got a small fringe, but then they had to say like, well, actually that fringe is due to link contraction and the speed of light is actually the same. And then when they did Mickelson Gale Pearson, they knew that they were going to get a fringe, right? So what did they do? They Ludwig Silberstein, who did the relativistic prediction or derivation for their prediction, they, guess what they did for the static ether theory again to put it up against relativity? Guess what? The, guess what happens to the to the hypothetical stationary ether while it's inside of the pipe, um, inside of the vacuum tubes while the Earth's rotating? Anyone want to guess? It's it's for some reason it's they bouncing stay. back and forth, creating uh, uh, uh you know canceling out the the effect of rotation. So the prediction for, that they made for stationary ether is that there would be no fringe. And then that way they could leave the fringe pattern prediction only to relativity exclusively. Yeah, it's stuff like, like isn't, that. Isn't that like, crazy? Isn't you like had dude, one motivation? <laughs> like yeah, one. <laughs> it's like dude, they use the same excuse like three times in a year, three it's times like, over the course of a hundred years. Like, <laughs> dude. Like, it's like that's wild. That always. It's wild that people can hear stuff like this. Is that's what's well, wild. Well, see, I don't, I don't think they hear. I think they've already tuned out. Anyone who want, needed to hear it, like, cannot hear it, so they just simply don't listen. It must for be sure, that way. for sure, for sure, for sure. They're super active in the chat talking about something else. They <laughs> They're eagerly typing it. about how dumb we are. Or something that's, yeah, that's yeah. probably it. Yeah, but but I don't know what Alan just said, but Wits is a grifter. So <laughs> <laughs> about the, about the size of it. <laughs> crazy man all right cool well uh yeah we're, it's almost three i'm not opening it up to you know hold on which where are you grifting at because i was in the youtube chat are you grifting in the, in the oh i don't channel? know i'm sure it's in there okay. somewhere <laughs> it's in a store near you but yeah obviously i have um relativity special general theory pulled up Supposedly, someone said that they were going to debunk what I say about it because I cherry-picked Einstein and then right above it, it shows something. It's like he's talking about how they say, he says, like, what can be interpreted as some evidence of the orbit is stuff like stellar aberration or whatever. It's like, what? That doesn't, that doesn't rebut what, I mean, that's something he can be talking about. I already know the kind of games they play. And that's because someone went and told him to say that. He he made a post. Was, I forgot. Ozian, I guess, made a post talking about, I think I have like a, I think I'm, I'm very apt to be able to explain this to people in a way that they can understand it. I have a, I have a knack for understanding it. And I want to make sure people know that like, what's it's, what's it's wrong. He's cherry picking Einstein. It's like, what? No. Like, buddy. I know that you're too confident to say that he's wrong, but I'm here to tell you on behalf of you that you're confident enough to not believe him. Yeah. It's like an MC tune or someone said, Look up up here. Hold he on. says stellar aberration. It's like that's totally oh. irrelevant to what we're talking. Oh, about. well, did did someone propose stellar aberration as mutually exclusive proof of the glob? Nah. Yeah, or yeah. heliocentrism? Because we sure. can cover that real quick if you want. Oh, he says he's quoting the part where Einstein says uh, Newton can't be debunked. With tracking. Okay. All right. Now. That's crazy. Let's talk about the real context of it and talk, and then let's talk about everyone that's ever studied relativity for their whole life and can actually read. I mean, Einstein also knew that they couldn't both be true. Like, so. honestly, to be an intellectual at this level and to propose what he just did means that you haven't read any paper. You've read the preface and a sentence, maybe a conclusion, and eat your way by on minimal effort. Otherwise, like, you're what? Like, held in contradictory views and unaware of Have you ever been to cause before, Shane? Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, man. It was great and awful at the same time. Oh, wow. Look at this. Here's one word where it says Newton. Let me add a final remark of a, fund of a fundamental nature. The success of Faraday and Maxwell interpretation of electromagnetic action at a distance resulted in physicists becoming convinced that there are, are no such things as instantaneous action at a distance, not involving an intermediary medium of the type of Newton's law of gravitation. Thank you for... I'll just highlight this part as well. <laughs> I mean, the first part of Newton that I click on of the paper... Are we serious? He's literally pointing out a difference, a fundamental difference, right? He's pointing out a fundamental difference between him and his understanding. It's right, like, um, 
not involving an intermediary medium of the type of Newton's law of gravitation, which is funny because when I point out, you know, Newton said, of course, there's no time variable. You'd have to have a mutu- uh, you know, intermediary medium with mutual contact. Word salad. Oh, but when Einstein says it, I guess, can we can we accept it then? Like the more I start highlighting this paper, the worse it would get for them. Maybe that's what we should do. We should just actually be like, hey, uh, James, can you set up a debate where we just go through this one paper? <laughs> you know, that's like the level we're at now. But anyway, uh, anybody have any closing remarks? No, that's that about covers it, man. Awesome stream. Much love. Love you guys so much. Uh, yeah, you guys are killing it. Not much to say. Lady says, to what extent is the special theory of relativity supported by experience? This question is not easily answered. <laughs> Guys, the stuff we talk about now, relativity isn't even too too tough to, to talk about, right? That wait, was wait. To... <laughs> where, where did you get that? Where was that Einstein's at? paper right here. To what extent is the special theory of relativity supported by experience? This question is not easily answered. For the oh reason my. already mentioned in connection with the fundamental experiment of Fizeau. I don't know how to say that. Fazow. 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 He's the one that uh, was one of the first guys to derive C, quote unquote. Uh, like measured it and measured the translational speed of a moving medium. How long ago? 1857. No kidding. Allegedly. So, so he's saying because of like, because of the measured quote unquote speed of light, which is actually just a rate of induction and a perceived rate of illumination that that's why it's hard for him to answer the question if his theory is supported by experience what the answer is just no right (laughs) that's actually pretty hilarious like it's like he knows he's got a big problem right there dude they still they still are writing relativistic explanations for Fresnel drag you know, something they figured out in the 1850s or, you know, 1818, really. They still are trying to, like, argue about how to explain that in a relativistic framework. Very ingenious. This is how, this is like, this is all relativity. Is This sums up what relativity is right here. Uh, well, it's hard to say, you know, any experience, but look, check this out. Um, the special theory of relativity has crystallized out from the Maxwell Lorentz theory of electromagnetic phenomena. So, thus, all facts of experience which support the electromagnetic theory also support the theory of relativity. <laughs> 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 so, wow. I hijacked some actual science and claimed that it works with my math. And so, that's actually evidence that my theory is true. Damn, I like that. Yeah. Can you just leave my unfalsifiable belief alone? I'd rather keep it forever. That's why, like, really, I, I think that's a big part of it. Is I, I, I thought this is, um, this was, like, what Einstein said about this was, like, he wrote it for your mother, right? So the idea was that he put it as simple as, he's, as he could. Now, in reality, it was always this illusion that Einstein was so much smarter than everyone else that, that he just couldn't be comprehended. It's like, no, his theory was so stupid that it couldn't be comprehended. This is where he had to actually try to make it sound logical and I thought like it's pretty easy to uh, to read and understand what he's saying in this paper and I found out that's not the case like you know that's just not the case like we can go over the same paragraph 10 times and the globe earther just doesn't understand it bro they'll just like the words are right in front of them and they'll claim that I'm wrong about the words like let me give you an example here this one right here where he explains Mickelson Morley like they'll say I'm wrong about this it says he explains that they came up with a test that should have been decisive, right? So all attempts to detect the motion of the Earth, you know, have been negative. Uh, all, all attempts to detect the motion of the Earth with terrestrial experience, experiments were negative. And before I proposed my theory, it was hard to reconcile that fact. One of the most notable of these attempts, Mickelson devised, and I had to circle these attempts because they claim it, he's only talking about Mickelson Morley. And it's no, he's talking about all terrestrial experiments. And he said one of the most notable of these attempts, right? Like, that's the kind of stuff they have to lie about. Anyway, and it says uh, that Mickelson devised a method that should have been decisive. And then he describes how it works. 
And he says that even though the interference uh, pattern should have been small, they, uh, uh, even though the time difference should have been small, interference was used, and that should have made it clearly detectable. But it, did, it wasn't detectable, very perplexing to all the physicists. Lorentz and Fitzgerald came in, tried to save save us from that problem by saying that the um, the ether produced contraction of the body in the direction of motion the amount of contraction being just the right amount to compensate for the time difference that should have been there and then he says comparison with the discussion in section 12 shows that from the standpoint also of the theory of relativity this solution of the difficulty was the right one that means in the context of Michelson Morley Einstein himself is saying that relativity invokes contraction. Point blank. And I don't know why it's like, it's like I read this, I'm like, okay, we have to all understand it. And they act like they don't understand it. I mean, maybe they do, and they're, they're just being dishonest. I don't know. So, anyway. I mean, doesn't he very clearly say Lorentz tried to save the theory by claiming that the body right so the ether yes that's right he claimed an ether produces a contraction of the body in the direction of motion and that the amount that the body contracted was just the right amount so the amount of contraction being just sufficient to compensate for the difference of time mentioned above so based on the earth moving and there being perpendicular light beams should be a separation of the light beams should be a slight time difference and even though it's a pretty small amount we're using interference so we're going to be able to tell the difference right we're going to actually measure that small amount because interference patterns are so precise interferometry is so precise so it should have been decisive it should have been clearly detectable and then we didn't detect it then Lorentz and Fitzgerald came over and they said I'll fix this problem I'll say that the apparatus contracted just um, the right amount so that it would look like it wasn't difference in, uh, there was no difference in time or distance right and then of course they ended up testing this theory and proving it wrong by just having one arm be longer than the other one and it, it, it clearly wasn't contracting. But then you have Einstein come over here and say that from the standpoint of relativity also, the solution of the difficulty was the right one. This solution of the difficulty was the right one. What difficulty, right? Like, was that it was a negative result? What did they, what did they propose to save the difficulty? A contraction in the direction of motion. So he says that from, according to relativity, contraction in the direction of motion is also the solu solution to the difficulty of the negative result. So someone's saying like, no, you don't need length contraction to explain Michelson morally with relativity. It has nothing to do with that. It's just wrong. They're just objectively wrong and they're confused because... They, like as opposed to Lorentz's theory, you would see contraction on the Earth itself because the ether is contracting things, so you would actually be able to measure the contraction if that was true. Where on Einstein, he's like, well, no, because everything on the Earth, the apparatus, all the air around it, anything you could try to use to measure anything, you pull out a ruler, you, yourself, everything is contracting the same rate because it's all on the Earth moving in relation to the sun. And that you wouldn't be able to see or measure that contraction unless you were, for example, in the reference frame of the sun. But it's, you still have to invoke contraction as the physical explanation for the missing time difference. So, so it's an unfalsifiable, yeah. Yo, he didn't even, that's what I'm saying. It, this ties right into the, what Einstein did, which was like, oh, if we completely avoid like 10 questions and just don't even propose any type of answer to them, and then I think i can make it work mathematic mathematically like that's literally what he did because th what is the causal mechanism that einstein proposed for length contraction nothing <laughs> never not even proposed to this day no one's so even proposed one to this day bro yeah and people will think the answer is like oh no it's just moving close to the speed of light no 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 but what's the physical mechanism it's never been proposed like no one even knows and that's not just like a what's it made it up like there needs to be one like no first of all common sense tells you if there's something physically happening there has to be a physical mechanism there are extensive papers written about the fact how no one can figure out what the mechanism would be right I've talked to like physicists about it so anyway that's kind of that's the craziest part and then Alan points out stuff like what they did with Aries success 
It's like just just make stuff up. Okay, what's the what's the mechanism for that excuse that it actually goes the opposite way? I don't know what's what's the physical mechanism for that. Ooh, uh, imagination. Um, <laughs> Yo, isn't that refusal crazy? To, refusal to accept reality. Um, you know, cognitive dissonance, bias. Uh, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of different. Me- there's a lot of like mental uh, Alan, mechanisms you could I take. Think, <laughs> I think it might be I'm the boss, and that's it. Who cares? Then then they'll never know stupid peons. But that's just me. Yeah, when you pair it with MMX, it's really, really rough for them. Yeah, you know what Bob used to always say too for years? He's like, if you just compare MGP and MMX, it's game over. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. And he was so confused because, you know, Bob was like legit a genius, bro. So he he saw that. He was bringing it up to me and he was just so confused. He's like, what? It's over right here. There, wh- what am I missing, Austin? I'm like, I don't I don't see you missing anything, (laughs) you know? It's such a simple, simple understanding. It's like, if you're using the same type of methodology and technology to allegedly detect the motion of the earth in in a rotation, you should be able to detect the rotation around the sun. And so since you didn't, you're only detecting one rotation. The only viable option is that the earth is stationary and that the sky's rotating around it, right? That's the only viable option, obviously. That's the craziest part of this they, whole they thing. They're like, no, 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 I'm pretty sure it's out there. I've never measured it. I'm, it's, it's a stubborn thing. I'm, one day I'll get it. It's definitely there. And it's like, I don't know. Do you have to make like a principle 2.0 documentary that truly breaks it down uh, and then just move on? Because it, it's clearly in the circles that we're having the conversations, like it'll, they'll, they'll just lie about it forever. Forever. Right, so yeah, it's like the general I mean, public will accept it pretty quickly. Yeah. Exactly, like when I showed even Matthew learns, dude. I got him to watch Principal. He came back. He's like, Ugh, geocentrism may be true, bro. <laughs> oh, bro, nice. yeah. Matthew learns well, concedes a lot, dude. Well, he for him, that's show. not a problem at all. I right? think he's a secret flat earther, bro. <laughs> but you, you understand my point, though. Like when people actually go watch the Principal and really take it in, you know. As opposed to being like, oh, I read an article that told me why this guy sucks. And there was a couple <laughs> people in here that were mad about it. It's like... That's exactly what they do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, but what about the information in there? Oh, I don't know. I couldn't hear what they were saying. I was just I was just thinking about how stupid they are. I actually even watch it. It's like, <laughs> okay. But I, The Principal was like such an epic documentary for me early in my journey. You know, and I think... Us like making documentaries may be like the next step, but that's just my opinion. A ten dollar donation wow. from Ms. Mac. What's it? You are as handsome as the mythical globe. I am a flurf, but have doubts when it comes to the moons orbiting Pluto. Thoughts? Uh, what do you mean doubts? Like recently, you should put his moons as a clock wig. Well, or apparently they did when they were trying to sail. So like, stuff's there that has smaller orbs orbiting it. I think is. Maybe they can expand on their question, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, the phenomena is not exclusive to anything. They That's the whole trick, man. Everyone thinks that, like, everything we see in the sky is theirs or something. It's like none of it's theirs. They say the stars aren't there and that the sun is a star. They, like, yeah. you know. I they don't the understand way, I can't let them have it. The only way to explain that one, I think, is just purely that repetition. It's propaganda, right? That we were just drilled that from like literally from birth pretty much right you're showing globes and like the solar system from from child from birth childhood like a lot of people have the moguls above their heads so like i don't if you really think about it you know common sense would tell you that just because there are orbs in the sky doesn't mean that the flat ground beneath your feet should be the same thing like there's no logical line to draw that right other and than also- that full model you've been presented with and that thing you've been you've had embedded in your brain from young from a young age because that's one that for me i can't have i I can't i don't know how to logically approach that one with somebody because it's like that's the only place that they get that from it's like it just comes from the repetition throughout life i think you mean the stars in the sky I think it's fair. No, the idea that because those are spheres that the ground beneath you has to be a sphere. And dude, oh. by the way, just just bro, if there's something that's emitting light, it's gonna have a radius of light in all directions. 
Mm, I think some people do. Yeah, that's a good point. Some people do, I think, get tripped up on that as well. They can't imagine the idea of a star for some reason without... Well, just show them, show, show them Dragon but... Ball Z, man. Like, when they go Super yeah. Saiyan, the light goes in all directions, bro. Come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It doesn't have to be a sphere. It doesn't have to be a physical sphere I can walk on and play golf on. Like, that doesn't... Um, like, the yeah. stars look like they're just kind of far away just nowhere close as far we have to say the stars are close because they said such preposterous distances but they're still far away bro like yeah. like a hundred miles is far like when it comes to up in the sky right like a thousand miles three thousand miles ten thousand miles that's super far away when it comes to going up in the sky but like up to what what's up there isn't there certainly not the thing that you think is up there up there the further up you go like, i don't know my point this is just crazy. like okay so those things are pretty far away we call them close because they said they were so far away but like they're still pretty far away doesn't matter uh, something emitting light from that far away what are you going to see what do you expect to see if there's if there was a triangle and it was emitting lights from that far away you would see a sphere bro of light right like if there was a a dude playing a banjo right he'd yeah, look like a sphere time, right yeah <laughs> that's like yeah, right. Everything would be a sphere anyway. Yeah, that's what I, that's that's the part that's always confused me. Uh, Oliver Houston, we have a real problem. Thank you for the five dollar tip. And only if you look at the problem, though, Oliver. What you know about that? Um, and then let me read the rock fins. Costa Katsadoros. Thank you for the ten dollar tip on Rockfin. Much love. Sick with it. Appreciate you, bro. Uh, what's so crazy is on Rockman when you put exclamation marks, it makes a question mark. So it's like, appreciate you, bro. Four question marks. I uh, appreciate you too, I think. Now, thank you so much. Sick with it. Thank you for the twin dollar tip. Much love, brother. Fishhead Montana. I'm donating because of inspiration from Robert Hunt. Baller extraordinaire. That's the uh, the dedicated Rockfin exclusive troll. Um, thank you for the $2. Fishhead Montana. Winston, 1875, $10. What's it? What's up, my G? Much love from Edinburgh, Scotland. Keep fighting the good fight, brother. Thank you for keeping me sane. No problem, man. Thank you for uh, supporting the content and for being here. Uh, greatly appreciated, as are the kind words. John Key, thank you for the $5 tip on Rockfin. Shout out to all the legends on Rockfin supporting free speech. If you don't have a Rockfin account, you want to pop over there. One of my next few streams are going to have to pop off of uh, YouTube pretty quickly. RG the R's just came in with $10. At this point in history, it's unification that we desperately need. I know that's what I was telling the boys the other night. I'm like, it's so crazy that when people are like, where's your model? And if I like, if I'm like, okay, here, it's just a unification of everything at all scales. <laughs> you know, it's like, shouldn't you like love this? Like they they flip it on us like we don't have a model. Our model unifies all scales, right? A tor torus field geometry unifies the smallest to the biggest scale. Ether unifies it all literally. It sews up all the problems in quantum, sews up all the misinterpretations of light, sews up all the interferometry measurements, all of these tests that we discuss so much, like. It explains everything. It explains the redshift in the sky. It explains the redshift anomalies in the sky. It explains everything, bro. It explains the actual, gives you a physical dynamic uh, mechanism for the rotation. I just think it's crazy. I think it's, it's so ironic to me. But whatever. right at one point, I was like, either everything I believe is true or everything I believe is false. Is I've eliminated all the other options. It is crazy to me. Um, let me check if you uh, if you want to see the exclusive live stream. I think it may be tomorrow. Um, make sure you check uh, either sign up at members.misswits.com. Links in the description, or uh, if you're already on, say like Patreon, or if you're already on um, Kofi, then check your messages and your emails. And I'll see if I can post it exclusively for the Kofi on that website for those who haven't gotten transitioned over. And I'll do the same thing for Patreon. Um, Daniel Haynes purchased uh, Tier 3 Earth. Welcome to the Misfits, Daniel. All right. Uh, cool. I think we're good. I think we can go to closing remarks because we could go forever, forever. But uh, I think some of the – I mean, I may end up trying to, like, put together a, a GPS – 
PowerPoint of my own, but I think Alan's already done such a good job. A $10 donation from Oliver. Hey, Austin, thank you for making me better at debating. I've been watching all your debates, and I've truly become better and at putting my point across. Awesome, bro. That's why I do it. I do it to wake people up and so that people feel more comfortable discussing the subject with other people. So uh, I love to hear that. And thank you for the support, brother. Yeah, dude, you have you have the truth on your side. No reason to be scared. Take take GPS satellites next. They're not going to know what to do. I mean, they, what do they have left? Well, before we get out of here, like, what do they have left? Pendulum? Nothing, no. Yeah. Nothing took it all. Pretty much, right? I mean, ring laser gyros, no. Like, any interferometry, no. GPS, no. Satellites, no. Seismology, no. Seismology. Whew. Yeah, they don't even have seismology. We found that we found the silver bullet. They make velocity assumptions based on uh, composition of the Earth assumptions. Duh, right? So, like, how do you... Okay, they say, I know that the the uh wave the sound wave right the vibration is going through the earth this fast because i know that the density of the earth is this because it's made of this and you're like wait how did you determine that the density of the earth was made or was that and that it was made of that because of how fast it went (laughs) (laughs) literally literally it's so funny bro and then it's like, oh, it didn't go the right speed. Well, we'll just change what the Earth's made of. <laughs> okay. It's an anomaly. Yeah. It must be something you know, completely different down there. You know, you know how we know it's a globe, bro? Because when we took measurements, there was anomalies that we had to create to explain why there was an anomaly <laughs> in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> Same with gravitational measurements, everything. Uh, $5 from Oliver Photos and Videos, LOL. Yeah, no, if that's all you got, it's a wrap. But thank for the donation. Dude, to be honest, how they use geopotential is, is insane. They use, like, anytime anything needs to be done, they're just like, squirt a little, yeah, it's just a little too gravity. It's fine. It's justification to do anything they want at any point. It's, re- it's crazy. Every single bit of it, when you try to warp reality and shove it into something that's not reality, obviously you're going to run into a wall over and over. And they well, have mean, an endless ability to just change the claim. You can go to like, and you, you you can go to measure the Earth and like compare it to like a geodesic geoid model and be like, boy, it doesn't fit. You know what it probably is? You see that mountain over there? It's got a lot of geo potential and it's pulling my bump off just a little bit off. So like the gravity here is just like all crazy. Let's let's just chuck that up to the gravity. That's kind of how it goes. Oh look, there was a thunderstorm and the object fell at a different rate. That probably just means it messed with the instrument. <laughs> Newton's Newton's shell theorem takes away their iron core, and then that takes away point specific gravity. I mean, honestly, that's kinda it's actually pretty massive take away the iron core you take away point specific gravity and the whole thing is really nonsensical man i don't know what they have they don't have tidal theory they don't have seismology they don't have they certainly don't have tidal theory (laughs) no they don't have a geodynamo they don't have a geomagnetic theory they don't have the pendulum they don't have the gyro they don't have uh reciprocal zinnies they don't don't have have... by the way What's that? Taken. Gyro compass been taken too. They don't have gyro compass. Uh, in fact, all these things end up refuting their claim. Ironically, they don't have GPS. They don't have satellites. Uh, but we're like on the side, just subtly are like effortlessly burying the claim that people are out there proving something. So they don't have that. They don't have this photos and videos. Uh, you know, fallacious claim. Anyway, they don't even have that. Reciprocals and he's you know, yeah right. Dude. Like one paper that. Oh, I'm saying, dude, you know, they don't have dude, triangulation. Dude, what do they dude, have? Celestial navigation. I forgot about that. They don't have celestial navigation. They don't oh, have the they position don't have of the sun. Light rays to even pre- to even uh, assume how they think celestial navigation works. That <laughs> yeah, Superman. So everything many, about so their model is just kind of <laughs> everything like fights with each other and they have to like fight to make it fit. And ours just like seamlessly puts it in like like a puzzle place. <laughs> Let's like like a puzzle piece. You're just like oh, this works so nicely with everything else. And they're like, you're in there, you geodime. I'll make five more. You. I don't care. Everything is gonna be explained. It's fine. But think about it. So let's just compare like this real quick. So you go to the smallest scale. They have a bunch of bombarding little balls everywhere. 
that you can't actually find or discover. There's tons of anomalies that show that they're not balls, but you can just give it a mathematical number, claim it is a ball, and then promise that there are balls everywhere. And once you reify them, it proves that there are balls everywhere. But then when you assume that there are balls everywhere, none of the math even ends up working. So you make up imaginary balls that are there but not there. They're virtual balls. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then you still have tons of problems because even the virtual balls don't explain why they're, why there's basically uh, sh- balls where there are no balls in the vacuum. So then we look for another magical ball, which will try to piece it all together, and it's called a graviton. And we can't find that one. It's just just completely abysmal. Oh, but then we call we call light light uh, particle and a wave at the same time, even though duality doesn't exist in nature. And it's a paradox. We'll pretend it makes us smart. And then you move up to the local scale. You have terrestrial experiments directly refuting the claim of motion in many different ways. Like you can't even, uh, you have to invoke a stationary, stationary lab frame for everything. And that very, lo- that local frame that people act like we know for sure everything works. Like you assume a stationary earth for all of it. You assume a flat earth for all of it. And you really, it does your stuff doesn't even work there. We're showing you that the, the GPS signals, the tower signals, the radio propagation in general, like the, in, any type of light propagation, uh, any type of interferometry measurements, none of it even works. That's the terrestrial scale, okay, abysmal. We go up to the cosmological scale, and it's just incredibly bad, right? It's like, don't even want to look at it bad. Like, like uh, oh, everything makes it look, look like we're in the center. I promise that's an illusion because there's accelerative expansion. Oh, wait, it's going way too fast. Don't worry about it. It can go way faster than the speed of light in this one instance because space is nothing. Oh, how do you have nothing? I don't know, but you do here. And it actually has physical properties, but I promise it's nothing. And it's going faster than the speed of light because it's nothing. And that's why it can go faster than the speed of light because it's not information. It's nothing. So it can go faster than the speed of light. Oh, what's making it go faster than the speed of light? I don't know. Some magic energy that we can't find, can't discover. Whenever we did measure energy in the vacuum, it doesn't match it. It's by, off by 10 to 120 zeros but i promise there's something there and then yeah our gravity that we had to assume and reify and change all of physics to try to incorporate to save heliocentrism well we then went and looked at the sky assuming that math and magic nonsense and it didn't work it was off by 99 percent with a single coma cluster and now it's evolved into 83 percent of all matter must be invisible magical and dark dark as in we can never find it and then we also have this magical invisible dark we can never find energy and i promise that these two combined make up 96 percent of of our entire model trust me also if we go back in time we'll rewrite our creation account there was something called the inflaton which helped us to defy physics but it no longer exists there but i promise it did exist back in the day it's like our model is this everything is actually a torus field there's a unifying background medium and everything comes from that and then excited modalities take different um, forms and the primary geometry all at the small scale is a torus field oh look all of these things that you call magical little balls they actually move just like torus fields what would you know no way okay and they have equal and opposite reactions and you call them antimatter and positron positrons but we actually know like no it's just equal and opposite reaction there's charging and discharging within the background medium everything's interconnected now all of quantum boom you have an ether quantum mechanics is not difficult to explain at all right so then you pop up to the the local scale obviously we have the stationary lab frame well, yeah, because the Earth is stationary, right? We, the interferometry measurements make sense because it's changing with altitude, changing based on celestial phenomena like solar motion and periodicity of the sun and the moon. That's what we expect because the only rotation is the sky moves around a stationary Earth. That's what all evidence supports. We get up to the cosmological scale, and I think I now have a perfectly functioning dynamic explanation, not to mention that the kinematic equivalence has already been there, but actually to concede equivalence to them is actually incorrect because they don't have an equivalence. They can't explain the motions like we can right that's the most ironic part they can't even support or substantiate their motion so anyway all objects in the sky look like the earth is in the center oh perfect because that's what the model says that the earth is in the center we expect everything to look like we're in the center we have redshift yeah because you have centrifugal divergence coming out from the center of the magnetic field electromagnetic retardation we expect redshift we also expect anomalies because everything else in the sky is intrinsically electromagnetic you would have angular momentum coming around the vortex of the center of that torus field that's expanding out from the center point and then that's going to set everything into motion you're going to have a net inward accelerative force that's going to keep it perpetually moving the only thing you would need is for someone to have started it and place the center at the center of the earth and it would go forever 
so we have a dynamic explanation, a kinematic explanation. We don't need dark energy. We don't need dark matter because we have an ether. We have a background medium. We don't, we don't need any of that nonsense. Everything's intrinsically electromagnetic. And then there's like etheric displacement that causes, uh, you know, things to sort out based on pressure mediation within a fluid like background. Everything's much more local, significantly younger. We don't have to believe all these fairy tales. We see the lights because the lights are there. And now everything from the small to the big is unified in a conjugate geometric expression. It's simple as shapes can explain everything, right? Like that nothing does not exist and that there's a shape that can show you all of existence. Think about how much simpler and, and function, functional and viable that is. It, to me, it's just so crazy. Like, where's your model? Like we're the only ones that's even in the realm of being able to say that we could formulate a model. So there's the recap of the situation. You'll hear the exact opposite. Uh, said with a lot of confidence, but all right, I put you guys to sleep. No, it was fantastic. I, dude, I think it's really funny that you can steal men there, like as well as you did, and we can just find it as funny as we do. And I was trying to find a flaw. I'm like, this is very nearly a steel man. No, no, it was exactly a steel man. You didn't even say anything wrong. It was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. To be continued, we had to leave a lot out. Um, but yeah, anyway, I think it's crazy. Let me say this one thing. I, I, like it just clicked with me so hard. I need. I want to work with someone that can help me model it. And I want to literally just, let's just make the model. You pop out, boom, you see Shane's model. You can see what you see in the sky. We got the dynamics, got the universe mapped out. Here's how galaxies work. Everything's electric. Look at the time lapse with the galaxies. Oh my, it looks electric. Oh my gosh, who would have known? Everything will work. And like just really wrap your mind around this. It's like almost gave me goosebumps whenever it clicked in my mind earlier. It's like, okay, you have a torus field and it's that's the entire universe, perceivable universe. It's just a giant, it's inside a giant torus field and you have layers of that torus field. Well, that's how it works. If you've seen like feral cell images or some of Ken Willer's images or just how we know magnetic fields can be measured via all, all kinds of things, right? All kinds of meters that we use and um, pressure mediation can be detected with many different ways, even just like uh, detecting the amount of pressure on different sensors. We know the shape of the magnetic field, right? The torus field, it layers up. That's how it works, literally. So like you have the center little vortex and things like uh, there's motion out from the center and there's motion in towards the center at the same time and it layers up. So you have layers of this giant torus field and then you have all kinds of celestial phenomena within these different layers and that the center of it is right in the center of the earth. So it's not like the vortex, um, there's a vortex at the center of the earth and it's the center of the torus field of the earth. It's the center of the torus field of the universe. And everything is moving around that point and that's why they would never let you go. Never let you go to where Polaris is at your 90 degrees. All right, your zenith. Never, never, never. You'd be at the center of the universe, bro. That's what I think. That's why everything moves around the earth because everything's moving around that central point. And that's why when you start going out from there, latitude wise, you start, you start measuring effects because now you're away from the central axis of all rotation and all that angular momentum from everything that's spinning around it, right? is going to be detected more and more the further out you get because you're getting closer and closer to like the totality of the motion of everything moving around the center. It's pretty crazy to wrap your mind around, bro. Like that we're in a giant torus field and the vortex is at the center of the earth and that vortex, right? It's the center of the entire universe's torus field. If you just start zooming out in your mind and see the whole universe moving around that point. And of course, if I'll say this one last thing, like if the earth, if we are in fact in a geocentric universe, well, the only questions you have here, it's like, uh, well, what placed it there? Well, if the earth is in the center and we exist on here, obviously it was created. So yeah, that's why it was placed there because it was placed there. It was placed right in that special point and they put the, the center of all of perceivable existence in the center of the surface of that plane that we live on, right? 
And then you, uh, the next question would be like, well, what made it move around? Well, it, <laughs> as soon as it was placed there, it has a vortex. Like it started the motion. All you, once it starts, it'll never stop unless it's supposed to, unless there's intervention. So that's crazy, crazy to me, bro. Cause that's like, you, you have a dynamic explanation for everything in the sky. Because then you just have smaller, more localized versions of that same phenomena in the sky. And you get galaxies, you Wait, get orbs of light. Did you say dynamic cause of the sky? Yeah, dynamic explanation for everything in the sky, yeah. I think I just said to myself that we don't have that. Maybe I missed it. Hold on. Let's bring it back. <laughs> well, okay, yeah. The, the primary dynamic explanation for, say, the motion in the sky would be that, literally, since the, the Earth's in the center, it had to just be selectively placed there. So, I mean, for whatever it's worth, if someone asked that question, like, well, why is it the Earth? It's like, because that's how it was made. What do, you, what do you want from me? You mean to start making up infotons? Like, no, I just necessarily seen the creation's creator. We were in the center, whatever. We were, it was placed there. The vortex is in the center, and everything, it's just like a giant torus field. So there's a vortex around that central point. Well, then you have this huge expanse of things in the sky, seemingly a fluid medium, Right and it's spinning around, what it's doing is generating a ton of force, right? It's just generating a ton of force. And it like, so it's gonna start, it's gonna be a centrifugal force from it spinning around. There's also gonna be a Coriolis force from all the stuff from the all, furthest outside all the way in, all of that, uh, what people would call mass, whatever it is, all that physical presence, as it spins, it generates a, a force, a centripetal force which is just like a provable thing that happens, right? So then there's the angular momentum of the whole universe spinning around, the vortex in the center, and that's going to keep everything moving perpetually. And you could pop out there and just catch a ride. It is the only thing we've ever been able to measure, so that's something for sure. So it just, it's just intrinsically electromagnetic. You have a torus field. There's a vortex. It's spinning around. The central null pressure point would be in the center of the, uh, the Earth. That's it. So that, that the cause the cause is the portal out of this place. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like the center of a magnetic field is basically a portal. Like if you're looking at that black hole, it would be, if it it would be pure potential. It would just be the ether. It'd be like concentrated ether there. Like that's what would be in the center. That's the source of everything. Everything's coming out of there. Like that's how magnetism works, right? So Anyway, what I'm saying is you now, you have a physical dynamic explanation for the actual motion itself, right? You can explain how it would be perpetual. The only thing you would have, they, they could try to come back at you. And this is what, this is what Professor Parks did, by the way. He's like, what's, what made it start doing that? Like, what? A creator, man. <laughs> like, what? If that's your only gotcha is to ask me how it, like who put it there to start spinning in the first place? Like, are you just conceding now that we have a way better model? Anyway, to me, that explains everything, that, the actual motion, right? Now, if you're going to talk about why do things move in relation to each other inside of it, well, I mean, you're going to get back to magnetism real quick, I would say. so. Right, like, I mean, what a coincidence that the galaxies look like spirals. Everything looks like a magnetic field. So anyway, I don't know it was a lot, but that's what I think. I think that you can create a completely function. The only problem is though, like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make up distances and sizes and a medium. For a model. You yeah. you're gonna have something. But I mean like so like so the, a good example is you don't need the distance to the sun and the moon that they say it is for it to work in reality, right? Like ex exactly what Walter Wisdom put was put like those values there and then you know what does that mean does that increase the distance no 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 it's just a ratio from the distance that it is from this side to this side of the circle that it travels like that's all the distance is like I don't know oh I mean I'm not I mean yeah you could obviously what I'm saying there's a huge range of values you could plug in there and make it work right that's why you yeah. can scale it, scale it covariantly but you gotta choose a factorial that's single appropriate but I think we should definitely make a model of everything then yeah, probably. And then make it visualized. And like like somewhere someone can go, like a website, and they can like every question they have, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's like superior to the mainstream in every way. But it's like I will say quantum player. alone is like to, to, to articulate and write out the replacements for quantum alone would be quite a bit of work. I mean, QFT basically hijacked the ether, so 
you know, you would just re- rebrand their hijack. But I mean, you could go back to classical mechanics, a stationary lab frame, uh, energetic background, primary substrate. Everything's coming from that. That's a fun, fundamental unification. Well, we're going to jump into, we want to try and figure out uh, how Edotovsky from uh, Russia, how he came up with a lot of his ether dynamic or ether kinematic uh, numbers and see if we can find out if he, if we can figure out how he derives some of that stuff, we might be able to, that might be pretty valuable for coming up with some of that quantum stuff. Nice. Yeah. And oh, I, what I don't understand though, is how do people hear this though? Like I, do I sound like a crazy person? Like, let me phrase it like this. Okay. Like if you look out in the sky, there was, there was a position that was held by everyone on the earth forever. It was that the earth's in the center of all existence and everything moves around us and it's very beautiful. We should be appreciative of such a thing. Then some psychopaths that, that touched little boys came along and they started talking about how, no, we're actually insignificant and the sun should be worshipped and we're flying. We're one of those lights up there, I promise. Trust me. Right? And so then you have two predictions of these one is like okay well as we get better technology and we can see further and further out in space we're gonna see that everything's moving around us and that everything is completing a cycle together it's one giant cycle with the earth in the center that's the prediction the other one is like oh as we're able to see out further it's so big what we're gonna find out is we're nothing nothing cares about us stuff's gonna be shooting every which way we're just tucked away and insignificant what did we see when we actually started getting that technology that everything moved around us everything moved around the earth in the center everything so whose theory was right okay so what did the other side do they said okay well we have to uh like always absorb the truth and then change our theory to claim that our theory predicted the exact opposite of what our theory originally predicted right and make sure we never even consider the one that's just been predicting it the whole time and has been right the whole time i said okay well yeah sure it looks like we're in the center and and everything you ever see will make it look like the earth's in the center but it's just an illusion because everything's accelerating expanding away from you in all directions there is no center everything is relatively the center and uh then they're like, okay, what's causing it to do that? There's there's a force that's, there's some type of energy that's causing it to accelerate and expand, but we can't find it, we can't see it, we can't detect it. When we do measure vacuum energy and we assume that that's out in the sky, it's off by a 10 to 120th power. It's not even close, doesn't work at all. But there's magical dark energy, and then our gravity that we needed to save heliocentrism, it's off by, you know, 99% for one cluster, 83% uh, missing mass in the universe. And then the other side's like, oh, we don't have any missing mass and we don't need dark energy. What what part of that doesn't resonate with someone? That's what I don't get. I really don't get it. Those are just facts, right? Like, I'm not straw manning anything. I'm, t- I'm t- like, that's a fact. Like the geocentric model doesn't need dark matter. It doesn't need dark energy. All the observations match exactly what it would predict. Why would it not? How is it not pr- obviously the accurate position? I don't know. It just blows my mind. I'll stop ranting. I just don't. I honestly don't get it. I don't see how somebody hears all that and like. I guess they just convince themselves it's coming from me, so it must be a lie or something. Is that what they? No one. No one's listening. That three hours to you at this point. Who's was on the other side? <laughs> There's uh, yeah. no way. Yeah, I guess if they've just heard that before, you would think. Um, Ms. Mag, this is a random thought, but I've seen hundreds of pictures of the Sirius star that have a definite circle with an X going through them using a P900. Has anyone ever noticed that the center of the Vatican has the exact symbol slash shape? Something to look into. Wow, no, I haven't. That sounds like some gravy. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look into that. I've never heard of that, but thing for the five-dollar tip sounds interesting for sure. Flat man flat, going to work and saw you still hanging. We'll catch the full show later today. Peace. Wow, it's super late. All right, flat man flat, thank you so much for the $10 tip. Sorry I just ranted forever at the end of this really long show, guys. Do you guys want to um, say something to wrap it up or say bye? Tell everybody where to see you or what you got coming up. Is everyone Never like asleep? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's funny. Let me. 
Probably. Boys. Shane, what you got coming up, bro? I don't know, man. I got presentations and presentations coming up, but I'm not sure what we're going to do publicly. I mean, trying to get some debate going on, but I'm not not too uh, hopeful anymore. Definitely be checking out Ether Cosmology, though, as always. Probably do the Ether, was it called the Roundhouse or the Suicide Run or whatever you call when you want to go willingly into MMM and answer questions about Ether, dude. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, um, on Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern, Toby and I are going to the medicinal mass media server to hit up, uh, you know, basically to get as much opposition as possible and present, uh, the, you know, the history of interferometry and, and just take ether questions, right? Because there's a lot of confusion on, you know, on, on both sides and people looking into this. It's hard to get the info. It's hard to find, you know, uh, resources on it. So we're going to go there present what we've been researching and and our findings so and we're taking like all questions so it's a like a live q and a you know a m a type thing so nice check us out there and that'll be streamed obviously and there'll be links provided to the discord if you want to go and check it out there very cool and what time you say friday uh, nine ten p m eastern nice good and then Friday will be flat earth Friday of course. And that should be kicking off around 9 p.m. Eastern, hopefully. And then we'll yeah. do it all again next week. Nice. Yeah, check out uh, check out Flat Earth Fridays on X for sure. Flat Earth Fridays on X. You can you can hashtag it. You can just like search the hour hashtag. Um. Cool. Shane Allen went. Toby maybe AFK. Everyone's like, dude, awesome, put me to sleep. Yeah, it's <laughs> late, we're good. But I, I think it was a good stream. Dude. Just, if I could, if anyone's still listening, right, and you haven't actually read anything or looked into yourself, just go read, like, you know, they go some more, they go look at a relativity, go beyond watching a video, read a little bit, and just, you know, look into it to yourself, I think would be a disservice not to at this point. $5 That's donation a- from Oliver, Antarctica trip comment, check Kofi chat. Um, okay, I'll check the chat, but... Uh, yeah, I'm still trying to set that up. I mean, that's a decent uh, ways away, but we'll see how it goes. I'll check the chat. Everyone everyone, check for the stream coming up. I need to go to sleep. I'm not supposed to be up right now. I had no idea it was really this late. It's <laughs> crazy. All right, let me just wrap it up. Um, all right, thank you guys for kicking it. Thanks for all the support. Sorry that it went so late. It was so long. I, I thought, okay, it's too late to do it. Okay, we'll do it. I'll just make it short, and then here we are. <laughs> crazy man all right um i love you guys i'm gonna go get straight out of here I'm, i think i may be uh hitting up nasa tomorrow which is why i need to catch some z's asap um stay up to date with it on say if you're a miswit anywhere just pay attention and then you'll be able to get some exclusive access and uh yeah that's about it we'll just keep it short um shout out to everyone that signed up and uh, i guess the exclusive perks will start now um, and shout out to everyone that helped uh, a support in the last stream. It helped me get um, the glasses. And then I'm still trying to figure out the annual pass. It didn't work, but I'll go get it in person or call them or whatever. But um, yeah, cool. And a different microphone, which I don't know if it'll get here in time, but blah, blah, blah. So shout out to you guys. Thanks so much. All that money went straight towards all of that, just like I said it would. And I think that I may have enough. Uh, I'll end up having like another gla- pair of glasses or two to help other people go with me in the future. All right, cool. Stay tuned. That'll be super cool. Um, that's about it. Just look. Just just stay up to date with the channel. We're gonna cover some gravy here soon. I don't know exactly what order, and it may end up having to move over to Rockfin and Rumble only. So go support there by following. And seek and speak truth unequivocally. The weak find contentment in the consensus of ignorance. So who cares what other people think? Other people are always going to attack you, even if they're coming from a position of ignorance. So actually, whenever they revile you for the truth's sake, rejoice. They did that to all the prophets before you. And what's true is rarely popular. What's popular is rarely true. Peace. Peace.
just like a renegade So pay attention, gonna get laid We're schooling globals till they all awake Schooling globals with diplomas and a chip on the shoulder Debate is over, mind is sober, so a system disclosure you Can't go back once you heard the facts We make a pact, never take the back School and ballers and the followers that give them the dollars They try to holler in the chat but you're a fraud, not a scholar They hating y'all, that's why they attack The earth is flat no matter how much they laugh Days of days, pseudoscience just a big charade Making theories they just can't explain On philosophically biased claims Days of days, we break away just like a renegade So pay attention Till they all away